Thank you so much. Please be seated. We'll wait. Thank you. Please sit down. It always takes so long here for everyone to be seated. Yeah. I have a, a microphone height issue. You have a height issue? Yeah. Because I'm too small and sitting in a normal seat, and a microphone with three inches of yeah. stand yeah. is still a problem for me. I have to sit up straight. Thank you all very much. A uh, show of hands for the folks who were dragged here and have no clue where the fuck you are and why you're here. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Please leave the building. That's how we do it. You will, so, you will soon like see to that get I serve no purpose whatsoever. Other yeah, than to yeah Jamie, please establish for everyone. <laughs> this is what I do. I hate myself, so I have to make up excuses. I'm working on it. <laughs> She's okay. working on it. That's all you need to know. I also like to overshare. Yep. That's another thing. Uh, could be you, a room full of mostly paid strangers, or the guy uh, putting the groceries in the bag we brought uh, that, that you will overshare with. This is true. Yeah, and I stand there wondering why he needs to know where we're going to dinner later. <laughs> so for those of you that have no idea, uh, this is the 7th anniversary of um, basically a live streaming talk show, I refer to it uh, in email invites, because I've booked all 264 guests. J. Mac, you're here. Does that number sound right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Every show I ever do, I hope there's someone in the audience named J. Mac. Is that weird? <laughs> I would just throw out a question. Very good. Tonight's J. Mac. Uh, 264. Uh, you know yeah. what? While we're, while we're on the subject, Jeff, how am I looking tonight? Any Jeff. <laughs> totally Thank you. dropped the ball, Jeff. <laughs> Jesus. Took a chance. We got a fucko, too, which is awesome. Yeah. Well, that's actually nice Jeff from the poker game who threw that right back yep, at you. He sure yeah, did. Yeah. That's an inside joke right there. Well done, sir. Not so much well now. Nope. Uh, so, yeah, so a couple years ago, the great Flanagan. I want to thank Flanagan and, and Michael and all the crew here at Largo at the Coronet. said, uh, do you know what you should do? You should do that fucking show live at the stage there, don't you think? It'd be great. And I said, when do you drop the phony accent? Um, That's what I ask you every night. It is, well. When do you drop the voices? <laughs> he doesn't. Every it's night. It's constant. This is what we do. I'm going to stop talking, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so yes, so we, it's Charlie Rose but fun. That's what I put in the email. As I, <laughs> as I warn everyone. It's a long-form, one-on-one conversation. J-Mac, there he is. He does the uh, stand-up and take a bow. For those of you who listen and watch the show, where is he? There he is. There he is, dead center. Get him. Go ahead, stand up. There he is, J-Mac. And Corey, you're here. You work on the show on occasion. Take a bow. Okay. Uh, one more time with the lights. Is Evil Dr. Chen here? He threatened Can to be here this evening. Where? Evil Dr. Chen, take a bow. <laughs> The folks want to know what the hell Evil Dr. Chen looks like. Angie's now, here, too, because she put my lipstick oh, on. Oh, Angie, please, Andy. Johnson here for makeup. Evil Dr. Chen. Bless you, Angie, for coming. Samantha Ward had other things to do. Uh, I, I keep saying Evil Dr. Chen, when in fact his name is Kenny Chen, but I would like him to be a Bond villain. And so I'm just going to keep saying the name until someone pays attention. So we, we have had... They end up being the longest on-camera interview that most of these people have given. Tonight, as Jamie pointed out earlier, it's like more like a variety show. Yes, it's the Kevin Pollock Smile Time Variety Hour. Smile Time? Yes. I like that. Featuring, uh, we got the Sam Levine Dancers. So, you know, well. And the Jamie Foxx Orchestra. Yes. Coming up. Uh, so we'll have three wonderful guests tonight. Normally, it's just the one for a very long time. Long-form conversation. Some would say too long. Uh, Tom Hanks went two hours and 42 minutes. He's a talker. <laughs> Couldn't shut him up. Uh, you John, know, John Landis still has the record. That's, he does. I got to tell you, less than 10% of the crowd raised their hands when you asked uh, who was dragged here. So the rest of the crowd, they already know all this horse shit. Yeah, or they were just too embarrassed to raise their hand. It's yeah. a possibility, but this seems like a pretty forward crowd. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're celebrating the seventh year of this. And you know, when we launched seven years ago on the internet, seven years ago, the internet wasn't the hip, fantastic forward machine that's unstoppable now. Uh, but seven years ago, uh, you, you know, you tell people you're going to do a talk show online and they think you've invited yourself to leave show business. 
Uh, it was announced on Twitter only. That was the only uh, marketing. And seven years ago, you, you remember what Twitter was. And uh, six episodes in, we were on the front page of the LA Times. Yeah, back when people read the LA Times. <laughs> In a paper form, seven years ago. That was and what there. happened the day after we were on the front page? I got... L.A. Times? Seven phone calls. You know, you, you, by the front of the L.A. Times is not the front of the calendar section. I'm talking about the front of the L.A. Times. In uh, the uh, column where they never do anything about show business. But it was about an internet show that was going to uh, have original programming, and it was a big deal, apparently. Uh, Seven people the only, uh, is all that called me up and said, hey, I saw you LA Times. Seven, four of which saw it online. <laughs> Slightly disappointing in terms of making the front of the newspaper without having killed anyone. <laughs> Seven people, hey, good for you. Uh, but that happened with just announcing on Twitter. So then we just kept doing it and now it's become... An obligation, really. It really yes. is. <laughs> yeah. We've had to move studios four Four times. times. No yeah, one will have us. We keep getting kicked out of every studio we've done. Well, now we do it from the Westside Comedy Theater. It's our new home. Uh, with no audience. So this is only maybe yeah. the third time we've done it with an audience. Maybe fourth. We were asked to go to a center for the performing arts in Arizona. Yeah, the show was booked. <laughs> in a center for the... That's what we said. In a center for the performing arts. And we laughed and said, okay. <laughs> we'll go do that. I'll finally pay Sam. Just a little scratch. Uh, so tonight we have three amazing guests, um, one of which has been on the show for the proper conversation. Um, he's the, uh, arguably, uh, I don't know who you would find to argue with you, but it's a little qualifier. Uh, I don't want to embarrass him. The number one touring stand-up comedian in the world, Mr. Bill Burr. <laughs> Yeah. So go to um, YouTube, Earwolf, iTunes for the full-length previous interview we did with Bill. Um, and then tonight you'll hear uh, some, some new conversation and then some stand-up as well. And then uh, we have uh, two other guests. The, the other one we've, we've, we've tried to schedule now on and off a few times. Couldn't be more enamored, if not a little obsessed, I think, with, with his talent and his energy, Mr. Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. A one-of-a-kind original uh, force in any art form is, uh, I think, the apex of the fantasy and the wish, and uh, he certainly has thrived there for many years. Our first guest, very excited about this. I saw a perform here on this very stage. Yeah. I think... Uh, for the first time, Jamie, was it the... Um, it was Tom Papa. Come to Papa. Correct. The live recording of Come to Papa, which they do on occasion. Has anyone seen one of those here? Yeah, yeah they're amazing, right? This is what I also love about that this theater. That is a true variety show. That is a true that variety a true show. Variety. Yeah, it's scripted. Oh, yes. it's fantastic. There's an announcer. There's nobody just rambling. <laughs> like I am. Uh, yeah, so, so one of the things I do love about this theater, the Largo at the Coronet, those of you listening from outside of these walls, uh, is that the audience is very familiar with other shows. Like they go to the calendar and they come back to the theater and they support live theater here. And I think that's pretty spectacular. But one of the great reasons I love to, to perform here and come see shows. We come see shows all the time. John Mulaney and Friends was a show we saw recently. So Come to Papa is a show. And then this performer walked out on stage. I knew him, of course, because uh, he's a very famous musician. Uh, his band had the number one album in the world, uh, Grammy for Best New Artist. Um, so he's historical musical talent in that regard, but I hadn't seen the current act, let's just call it that. And he came out and um, had an acoustic guitar and told stories that were mesmerizing and hilarious. Uh, there's a new documentary coming out about him. We'll talk about that. Let's bring him out, shall we? That'd be great. Yeah. Mr. Colin Hay. <laughs> Colin, Colin Hay to the stage. Colin Hay to the stage. Colin Hay. Thank you. Please have a seat. 
Colin, have a seat. I'm told you don't have to get too close to these microphones, even though I keep hugging and kissing mine. Uh, just so you know, that apparently they're quite powerful and can pick up uh, your thoughts. Which well, that's very good, because I'm very softly spoken. Yeah, yeah, I don't know that that's true. Has yeah. that ever been said? Yes, many times. Yeah? Yeah. And why do you think that is, as a, as a performer? It's, my, it's my, my father. My father was very softly spoken, and so am I. Right, and but he didn't end up on stage, did he? He did, he yeah. did. Yeah, he was, a, he was on stage when he was a teenager. Doing? He was a great singer and a great dancer. And I gave it up, you know, when his voice broke. But he was a child prodigy. Really? Uh, J. Mac, not That's in the, the research. Way. What the fuck? <laughs> The, the Tommy, the Tommy Morgan, the Tommy Morgan Review, in 1936 in Glasgow. In Glasgow, Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, where where you were raised, and he was a child, like 10, 11 years old, before the voice break, and he was singing and dancing. He on was stage. about 14, actually, yeah, and it freaked him out when his voice broke. But now, well, they were from Glasgow, but then my mother and my father moved to the coast, and if you move 20 or 30 miles in Scotland, you're very posh. Is that right? Just for moving? Yeah, for going to the coast. Ah. From Glasgow, because Glasgow, they came from the working, you know, very working class people. And right. They, they came from a very um, yeah, working class neighborhood. And they went to the coast, which was um, a place called Salt Coats, which nobody's really heard of. Until now. Until now. <laughs> but uh, the Glasgow Fair used to go down there for two weeks of the year. They call it the Glasgow Fair, when all the Glasgow workers would go down to the coast and they'd just destroy the town and then go home again. And, uh, so for that, that little time, it turned into the Jersey Shore, basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, so, and then, I mean, we went to Australia in 1967, but because but, uh, people say to me sometimes, well, do you have, still have family in Scotland? But before we actually left, you know, they moved. So it was almost like moving 30 miles is the same as moving to the other side of the world if you're right. in Scotland. Because nobody goes anywhere in Scotland, really. You know, you're, if you move 12 miles, I mean, you wouldn't go 30 miles for your holidays, really, you know. Yeah, yeah, so the idea of moving to the coast was just crazy talk yeah. to the locals. So, Why would so, you do that, right? And um, well, then once you got there, what, as a vacation spot, it makes sense, but as a place to live... As a place to live, it was magical. Yeah. yeah magical, because it was, you had, um, you had water. Sure. You had an outdoor swimming pool, and my mother and father had a music shop. A music shop? A music shop, yeah. So I was surrounded by guitars and pianos and drums and records. And uh, during the years between 1958 and 1967, so amazing. Those are some serious musical years. Some year. serious musical years, yeah. yeah. So Big transition. Yeah, it was beautiful. I used to come home from school every day, and my father would be sitting there, and he'd come here, come here, come here. Have a listen to these guys. And There's four of them. They have weird haircuts. He would play me a track by the Beatles. And yeah. He said, they're quite good. I think they'll do well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knew talent. He knew talent. And, uh, and so when... When does he see that sort of talent in you? I mean, is that a conversation that happens in your youth? Uh, or was that like coming out to your father? Um, the, he, he was very frightened that I would go into the music business, right. you know, because he thought that it was a dangerous thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, they got me singing lessons, so. They got you singing lessons at what age? 15. 15? Yeah, when I, went, when I first got to Australia. Oh, wow. And yeah. How old were you when the family moved to Australia? Fourteen. Oh man! So that's a ridiculous transition that makes no sense to you at all. It's it's a very strange thing. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Yeah. You know, when you go from Scotland, which is a beautiful place, but very very small, and you go to Australia, which is so massive. You know, it's like the same you know, same size as America, the states. But there's about you know, at that time there was about four people there. You know. <laughs> Who didn't know each other weirdly. <laughs> And everyone lives around the coast, and, and people would say to me, um, what are you doing Friday night, Colin? I go, nothing. I go, oh, you want to go to a party? And go, yeah, yeah. So they would come and pick you up, and you'd drive for 45 minutes, and you know, I thought I'd been fucking kidnapped, you know? <laughs> you, see, you don't go anywhere in Scotland for, it takes 45 minutes to drive. <laughs> and then they would get completely You'd hammered. be on the coast if yeah, you drove 45 minutes. Yeah, that's sure. right. Yeah, the other coast. Right. And, uh, and then they, people would get so hammered, so, and then they would just fucking drive home, you know? And, uh, <laughs> didn't seem to be a problem. But uh, no, it was, it was, and everything was massive. You know, the, the oceans were massive, and it was a very, very freeing thing, you know, coming from very Little socially tiny. entrenched Scotland, where, you know, there was still, I used to go home and get, get beaten up by, I mean, I, I have great images of my father, because um, 
you know, he was a very heroic person when I was growing up. And, and going to the other side of the world was a big thing, but even in small ways, I remember walking home from school. And I mean, I was brought up a Protestant. I didn't really know what that meant, but it meant I had a fucking blue blazer. You know, that's all it really meant. And I would walk home and I would get attacked by these guys with maroon blazers and they were Catholics, you know? And fucking I, Catholics in the maroon blazers, And, I, and I, knew they were, I knew they were going to attack me, you know? And I could just tell they were walking towards me. And this one time, I just, I thought I'll attack them first. They won't expect that. Yeah. So I just ran at them and I kicked the guy on the outside and I kept on running. And they, they, got, uh, they got an initial shock as I remember, and then they started to chase me, and, um, and they were gaining on me because I wasn't a very fast runner. <laughs> I remember I was very stylish, but not very fast. <laughs> I remember looking in the shop windows thinking, fuck, you're looking good. <laughs> just, just, as you were running. Just, just, just run a bit faster, you know? <laughs> and I looked down the road, and I saw my father's car parked, and the passenger door was open, and he was just standing next to the car, just going, uh-huh. And I just flew into the car and he, and he said, uh, not today, boys, you know, so save my skin. Yeah, he did. Holy crap. Uh, <laughs> so they take you to uh, the singing lessons, but what, that doesn't put an instrument in your hand. Which, by the way, we, it feels so naked here to not have a guitar. We, uh, it is very weird, I have it, to say. Is it in, your, in the dressing room? It's somewhere back there, yeah. Flanagan, for fuck's sake. <laughs> of show business power, yelling at the owner of the venue. <laughs> well, look at that beautiful guitar. Yes. That's a stunner. I'm gonna put stunner. her back here and yeah. then it's up to you whether or not people just look at it. I think it's good just to have it and not play it. <laughs> Talk about a power move, that is. Well, you see, I, and I drove to Montana to, to the, it was, a, it was a, a bit of an odyssey. I drove up to Montana to Bozeman where they make these. And uh, they said they would give me a tour of the factory. So it's like going to score drugs. And they took me upstairs to where they have the special stash of wood. And I looked at it all and I picked out all the bits on it and all the different parts to it. All these different luthiers were standing there. And they said to me, uh, they said, uh, Mr. Hay, we're going to build you a Gibson J200 and we're going to send it to you. And uh, it's going to be a beautiful guitar. And that's what they did. So um, it's my, it's one of the, it's a, it's a thing of joy. Yeah, it must be. Mm. It must be an extraordinary well, That's thing. one of the great things about uh, coming to America was that's what, that was, that's, this is where all, the, where all that was born and still lives, you know. You could only look at it from afar. You being, mean being guitars? From, yeah, or music in general. You know, you would, uh, you know, in Scotland or and then I went out to Australia, there's great music got made in Britain, obviously, like sure. we all know of. But, but just going, to the, going to, the, to, the, to the heart of it, coming here, and even just still going on tour and uh, going to all these different places, whether it be uh, Memphis or, or where, where, wherever you care to mention, it all has a, all has a musical history to it. Yeah. You're, uh, you're, you're starting to, your dad's bringing you home, making you listen to these four haircut weirdos. Uh, and what other music is catching your ear at that time that's actually inspiring you to pick up a guitar? Um, Everything, everything. Yeah. The Beatles, the Kinks, the Rolling Stones, and the Who. And then my brother played me Booker T and the MGs, which was a very scary record. It was Green Onions. It was very mysterious, and scary. Uh, scary, yeah, but 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 incredible. And but so I had a teacher. That, well, they actually bought me. They got me guitar lessons as well before I left Scotland. So I would get on the bus every Saturday and go up to West Kilbride, which is a, the next town up from where I lived, and I would get classes from Alison Bell, who was four years older than me. And she taught me how to play House of the Rising Sun. And uh, that was it from, from there. Because it's got all the great chords in it. Uh, you know, House of the Rising Sun. It's all the got great ones. All the chords you need. And it's got the, what I call the, the um, you know, the, it's, got, it's, it's got the minor chord, you know. And then you've got the nice C shape. Then you get the D shape. And then you get the really scary F, which you have to cover two strings. That's a fucker, that one. <laughs> And so you'd always go. <laughs> That's that scary fucking F, huh? So I, um, I employed, I employed, uh, I used my tongue, which seemed to help. So if you go.
Well, that is the price of admission right there, a guitar lesson and this is a distinct. Colin this is a distinct show with the fucking viewers at home at a, at a, at a distinct disadvantage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they certainly are. Uh, so, so Alison Bell, she taught me. She was, she, she was a violin player. Uh, she took it off her shoulder and showed you how to play it like a guitar? What no, she played guitar, she played guitar also. Uh-huh. And strangely enough, this is, I don't know, this is, I wouldn't say it's a, it's a long story, but I played at the Edinburgh Festival in 2004, and uh, these guys wrote to me, and I hadn't seen them for 37 years, and they wrote to me and said, Stevie, uh, Stevie Dowds, his name is, he was, he was a tough, hard man at school, became a headmaster. He wrote, they wrote to me and he said, um, Hey, Colin, we're coming to see you on Friday night. Me and Willie Dixon and, and, <laughs> and Nori Burns and Colin McSeveny and these names. I went, oh, fuck, I hadn't, seen, I hadn't heard of these guys for 37 years. And they came to a show I did at the Edinburgh Festival. And also, I did this interview to Aberdeen. And the only person I knew in Aberdeen was Alison Bell. And I said, oh, she's probably not listening. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll thank you for teaching me how to play the guitar. This is 37 years after I left the country. So... Anyway, she, she finds me. Her husband was listening, so they got a hold of me. So they all oh came. God. They all came to the show. So I had Colin McSeveny and uh, Willie Dixon, Naughty Burns, and um, Stevie Dowson, Burns. Naughty Burns. Yeah, oh. all very handsome men too. Sure, you know? sure, of course. And uh, <laughs> I think we all pictured Naughty quite handsome. Naughty, right? yes, <laughs> Naughty, Naughty, very handsome man. And uh, and Alison Bell came, you know. And so we're all upstairs, and uh, it was just like some weird, bizarre play. Where after thirty-seven years, I'm seeing these people I haven't seen since I went to school when I was fourteen, and and Naughty Burns actually was in love with Margaret Swindle, who was Willie Dixon's girlfriend, and he'd never told, he'd never told Willie Dixon. No. <laughs> never told Willie. Ex what a dick. Until 37 years later at my show at the Edinburgh Festival, and he said, you know, I walked into the bus, Willie, and you were there with Margaret, and I was going to give her a rose, and you gave her a kiss on the lips, and I was just fucking mortified. <laughs> See, I told you it was a long story. <laughs> no. <laughs> This is the great... By the way, when I saw you perform at Come to Papa, you did not tell that story, but no, whatever story I've you told... I've never told that story before. That, well, we're, we're honored and tickled, and I can't wait to find that prick who didn't... Uh, no, I know. Yeah, yeah. not in, yeah. I wrote it down. Um, <coughs> that's a fucking serious-looking pen, that, that man. That's, Jesus. Yeah. That's, 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 you yeah. don't want to write stupid words with that? No, you don't. <laughs> yes, that's serious the, words. That's actually the Tom Cruise pen. Uh, you'll have to read my book, How I Slept My Way to the Middle, to understand what that means. <laughs> but uh, don't touch it again. So here's... <laughs> I see. It actually floats. Give it a second. Wait. Um, but, uh, but you did tell a story that night um, about ha having a fan who's a Beatle. So your dad says, listen to these guys. And then at some point... One of these guys. Oh, right. Well, I met two of them. Right. Yeah, two of those guys. Sure. And uh, well, uh, John and George had gone by by the time I'd met. I met Ringo. I did a couple of tours with Ringo. I was driving along the freeway and uh, the, what was it Santa Monica Boulevard? And they and um, I, they called me and said, "Do you want to go on the tour with on tour with Ringo?" And it was just one of those moments where you go. Fuck yeah! <laughs> of course I do, you know. And uh, and it was me and uh, Paul Carrick played keyboards and um, John Waite played bass and Chili E played drums and Ringo. And I hadn't met him before the first day of rehearsal. And and we we were playing all these songs and I was the only guitar player, you know. And I've never been known for my incredible lead guitar playing, but I, pl I learned all the parts, you know. I sure. learned all the parts. And uh, the first song we had to do was a song called Never Without You, which was a, a, a new song by Ringo. It was a song about George and it had an Eric Clapton solo in it, you know? And, you got uh, to play an Eric Clapton solo. Yeah, well, well of sorts, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so we're playing, so the first, first time I'd ever met Ringo, he goes, oh yeah, let's just do Never Without You, you know, get it out of the way, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I go, oh, that's great, boss. I said, the first song we're doing has got an Eric Clapton solo in it. You know? And he goes, oh, don't worry about it, Colin. Just do your version of Eric's solo. He goes, do your solo. It's cool, man. You know, do, do your version of Eric's solo. And I go, OK. So we played, we played the song. It came to the solo, and I fucked it up something shocking. You know? <laughs> Even to the point where, he, where Ringo goes, oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> And then after that, Paul Carrick goes, he goes, don't worry, boss, Colin was just doing his version of Eric Idle solo. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Right. So anyway, sorry I interrupted you. No, you didn't. <laughs> so, no. Then, so then, um, uh, actually, the old Largo, yeah. uh, McCartney came right. to a show. That yeah. was the, the story you were telling. It's a long story, that one. But, well, we got a minute. <laughs> so it was the old Largo, and... Um, so I was, and, and so I met Flanagan many, many years ago, and so it was just when he opened the old place, and uh, I started playing there, and um, I think it was 2000, and I was upstairs in the band room, and uh, the guy in the door comes upstairs, and he goes, he goes, fucking McCartney's in the room, and, uh, and I go, oh, yeah, 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 sure, 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 and uh, Flanagan looks at me, and he goes, he is, actually, and I go, oh, and I f the first thing I thought, actually, was, fucking, you know, taking him a while to get here. <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, I don't really know whether he came to see me or whether he actually was just there. He might have just been there and I happened to be playing there, but I've built up in the last 15 years to the point where he definitely came to see me. Yeah. <laughs> and I walked downstairs and he was just, he was just standing there um, and he looked statuesque. He looked exactly like you'd imagine a beetle to look. And he just started speaking to me like as if he knew me. And I'd never met this man before. But you know that feeling where you've known someone all your life and they start talking to you and it seems like a very natural thing. He said, oh yeah, he says, listen, you know, we're just a bit jet lagged, you know. He said, you know, we might have to leave. He said, don't get offended, you know, we're just a bit tired. I thought you were gonna go on a bit earlier. And I said, stay for two songs. He said, okay, great. So they stayed the whole night and then they took a, an album away with them and after the next little while, had a little email exchange, and, which was very nice. And they came to another show, and they wrote to me. It was when he was first dating Heather Mills, give you an idea how long ago it was. <laughs> and they wrote to me, they said, well, why don't you come and see you play? I see you're playing at the Canyon Club, which is up there in the Gura Hills. I said, I am. He said, we're going to come and see you on Saturday night. So I said, very nice. So they came along, and I was playing with my band, and I thought, well, I need to be on my game tonight. So they came, him and Heather and, the sister, and Heather's sister. So... After the show, we went into this VIP bar, and there was just a barman and McCartney standing at the bar, and it was like the fucking Shining or something. <laughs> it was like this red bar, and a barman just drying a glass, and McCartney just standing there like some kind of, you know, dream sequence, just going, "Hey, fellas, come on over here and have a drink." Yeah, <laughs> right, you know. And we just come off. We just come off stage, you know, another band, and I say to the band, there's McCartney standing over there, and they all go, mm -hmm. so we all walked over like in slow motion, and, and he started, uh, you know, saying, oh, that's great, you know, every note was a winner, yeah, great, really great, yeah, terrific, you know, and he held court for about an hour, it was fantastic, and then everyone sort of drifted off, and I found myself standing there talking to McCartney by myself, and it's a bit strange to know what to say to a Beatle when you've not really, you know, spoken to him before, you know? And he, so I just said to him, what are you doing over here at the moment? He said, oh, I'm making a record, you know? I said, oh, I, I said, it's a bit different from the old days, isn't it? He said, oh, yeah. And then he proceeded to tell me what it was like in the old days, you know? And I could have stood there all night. Yeah. He said, uh, you know, I'd have a song, you know? And I'd pick up John, and we'd get on the bus, and I'd play him a song, and he'd play me a song. We'd get to the studio and George and Ringo hadn't even heard the songs. So I'd play him for George and Ringo. George would cop the chords and Ringo would tap on a table. Then a man with a white coat would come in and say, right, lads, you're up. We'd have to go and play, record the songs. So we'd do a couple like that before lunch, a couple after lunch. It was fast, you know. I said, that is fast. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was, a, there was a pregnant pause, you know, in the conversation. And they said, we want to come to your house. <laughs> I said, you want to come to my house? And they, and they said, yeah. And I said, oh. I said, well, I said, I'm going on tour on Thursday. And they said, well, we'll come on Wednesday. <laughs> I said, okay. And I said, do you want me to make you something to eat? And they said, yeah. <laughs> I said, so you could say you're coming for dinner then? And they said, yeah. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> so they came on the Wednesday night. She came a bit early, and he came about 8 o'clock, as he said he would. And I came up from the studio in my basement and I'm standing there and I'm looking up and uh, I see this guy coming whistling down the drive. And uh, I just had a private moment to myself, you know, all those years in the shop of listening to the Beatles and seeing, trying to figure out what chord George was playing on that poster. And I just thought, fucking Paul McCartney's walking down my driveway. 
he spoke to me again. He goes, oh, there you are, man. Yeah, great, really cool. Yeah, great. <laughs> I said, come in, mind your step. And he came in and we chatted at all kinds of things. He said, oh, I didn't realise you're from Scotland, you know, you're a jock. He said, I thought you're from Australia, you know. We chatted about Butler's holiday camps and I made them this meal, a vegetarian meal of Cuban... Cuban beans and Peruvian rice and all manner of vegetables because they're vegetarians. And we're sitting around and I was just thinking, Man. and uh, we're chatting away, just a few people. And we finished eating, you know, and he picked up, he picked up all the plates and he took the plates into the kitchen <laughs> and he started running all the plates under the tap. <laughs> and I had another moment to myself. <laughs> you know. I just thought, fucking Paul McCartney's doing my dishes. <laughs> Yeah. Did a fucking crap, crap job too. It's a token effort, you know. I can't imagine why I'd want you to tell that story. Uh, so there's a very famous moment when your band, Men at Work, uh, your first album. Uh, I, um, peaked, I peaked very early. Yeah. Number one album. Tell me about it, Colin. In the world. <laughs> Yeah, I did 40 movies in the 90s. Listen, <laughs> uh, number one, uh, first, first album becomes number one in the world, Grammy for Best New Artist. You say, accepting the Grammy for Best New Artist, we're the men, we'll see you again. Yes, yes, famous last words. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said we're the men and you're never going to fucking hear from us again. <laughs> Well, that would not have been true either. No, no, um, it's, just, it's a it's a gag. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The there, there's a do when does a documentary film uh, come out? There's a, a documentary uh, film. Well, there's a, there is a documentary film called Waiting for My Real Life. But right. It's the, the, these these lads that did it, they're trying to, they're trying to get people to buy it, you know. So I, I don't actually know, but it's got, doing a round of festivals at the moment. Right. It's uh, it was up in Sonoma and it's, it was in Asbury Park and Nashville and so, I guess this year sometime. Well, I watched it, and it's it's an extraordinary yeah. journey, and also just the honesty of an artist. You know, the whole point of, of my wanting to do this show was I am f absolutely and genuinely fascinated by people's journeys. How did you get from there to here? And I feel like the best a documentary can do about an artist is to, to, to tell that story. And I, I highly recommend everyone to look for Waiting for My Real Life when... Um, when, it, when you can. When you can. Sure. And he'll bring it to your house. <laughs> I will. We'll go together. Yeah. Um, but don't ask him to clear any of those fucking dishes. That's too much. Uh, it was, it's, it's, um, I, yeah, my old, it was, bands are weird things, you know. It was six people and... We th that was a dream of mine to be in a big, to be in a you know big famous rock band, and and we got there, you know, and then of course it just went it went away very quickly. We broke up, and as bands do, it was a very f kind of fragile group of people. But uh, after that was over, I I didn't really know what to do, so I start I made a couple of rec I made a couple of commer um, albums for commercial labels, and they just died, you know. So I. I, I it was around 1991 when I got dropped by MCA Records, and I thought. Well, what will I do? And I didn't really know what to do, so I just thought I'd go on the road. And so I went on the road playing acoustic guitar and singing. But and I make a, a kind of a joke of this with singing. Uh, but it was a, I always thought it was an interim thing, something that I was doing while I bided my time and tried to figure out how, how to get um, how to maintain maintain um, uh, you know some level of superstardom, you sure. know, to what I'd become accustomed to. And of course, that didn't happen. And and um, so you spend a lot of, what I found is that you do, you spend a lot of your time looking behind you, looking over your shoulder right. or looking forward and you, you never, often you don't occupy the space you're in. And I found that the people were there, even if there was 10 or 15 of them and they, they were, they were there to see me play. And so I started to um, talk to them about what had happened to me. And then I found that it was the best way I could think of to avoid some kind of weird form of insanity. Sure, you know? so, absolutely. And so that became very, very important to me. And so that's really what brought me here. Yeah, well, a lot of that uh, sure, pure honesty and, and truth of, of a journey is in the documentary. And it, it's your, your ability to not just make 
peace with it, but no, it's not. It's, yeah, it's right. You know, it, that's the thing. It's, it's a weird thing. It's like a. It's, it's a, much it's more a, than that. Yeah, it's a real. It's a real tussle. You know, that whole thing. You know, sure. Of just making. Of making. You, you almost have to trick yourself. You know. But, but it'd be nice if, if there was someone who who maybe a Beatle, who could have said, yeah. as the album reaches number one in the world. You know, if you're a new band and your album breaks the top 100, yeah. it's historical. If it breaks the top 10. And the single too, yeah. it's historical. So to become number one, yeah. th there needs to be an ambassador of pain standing right. right there. Excuse me, sir. I will need a word with you. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Now come with me. You know, um, uh, and and our our album was. I mean, we sold millions, millions of records. You know, and um, but it was sixty not, million to date. Well, that's what they say. It keeps yeah. on going up. Sure. But um, but it was number one for four months. It never happens anymore. You know, no. It was like four, four complete months. I think Thriller was the one that knocked us off. And you know, the biggest song on that was Down Under. And um, but Down Under has been very, very uh, kind to me. I mean, it's really been that the song that's enabled me to just continue doing what I'm doing. You sure. Know? I mean, not that not that I wouldn't have anyway, but it's made me. It's it's enabled me to have this some semblance of a of a of a career where I can go on the road and and entertain people. And so I have a lot of. I have a lot of uh, time and respect for that little tune, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. You, uh, there's a moment in the documentary where you talk about um, the band going, b being asked to go on tour with Fleetwood Mac as the album is breaking mm. and, and racing up the charts. Um, anything from that tour in particular? Well, no, well, it was ex incredibly exciting because, for one thing, uh, the ascension is really the most important part of most processes. You know, once you get somewhere, you're kind of going, okay, well, here we are. Yeah, now what? Exactly. You know, so the, the, the ascension of before we left Australia, the tour we did before Australia was the most exciting. And then opening up for Fleetwood Mac, where we were the underdogs, you know, and, um, and uh, that was, I think that's the most exciting part of, of, of the whole, you know, American tour was... By the time we finished that tour, we, we had a number one album, and then we went on Saturday Night Live, which was another incredibly exciting thing to get to do, you know. And, right. You know, Eddie Murphy walked into the dressing room and said hello, and you're like, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and even, I mean, the Grammy moment was incredible because... Um, uh, yeah, you're in the dressing rooms, the, the line of dressing yeah, rooms. Yeah, line of dressing rooms. Miles Davis is next to us, Lena Horne, Ella yeah. Fitzgerald, all these people. And I was watching um, Ray Charles and Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis play a trio on stage. And I was on standing side stage. And uh, when they finished playing, Little Richard ran straight off stage and ran straight up to me and said, How was I? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, You were great. He goes, I know it was great. Could you feel me? Could you feel me? <laughs> And I just felt so fucking inadequate, really. To, I felt very white. And uh, he was very lovely. He was lovely. Uh, I was very stoned at the time as well. As I sure. Was. I love that he comes off stage and has to grill the first person he sees. Yeah. And then I, as he walked off, I had this coat that I really liked. And I thought, oh, fucking no one said anything about the coat, you know. <laughs> And, um, why is it richer? And why Richard. is he walk? And as he walked home, he went, "Nice coat." <laughs> <laughs> and that was the greatest part. Sure, that was the greatest moment. Um, oh man. Uh, and then. Uh, and then. Scrubs. It's decided that uh, you have a huge fan in Zach Braff. Yes. And he pulls you into this television show. Yeah, well, you know, one to of not the just use the song, but to have you sitting on a bench in the yeah, in the it scene. was um, it was really. I mean, this is the new Largo, of course, and and uh, but the old Largo playing live, you can't really overestimate that, you know, because I just I play I, whenever I just would play live, and he'll come and play, you know, so I'd play and. And uh, Zach would come. Zach, he came down. Everyone has been everything. So many thing, good things that have happened to me happened because I was playing at Largo. Is what I'm trying to say, you know. And um, uh, I remember Gary Shandling, who's sadly no longer with us, uh, came to a Largo show years ago. And just as I was walking on stage, he pat, he grabbed me by the arm, and and I looked down. And I thought, oh wow, it's Gary Shandling. And he said, I'm not staying. <laughs> Oh. And then I played the show, and after, after I, I walked off, 
and he was still there and he went, I stay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, yeah. so uh, Zach Brown. Zach, yeah, yeah. So that he brought Bill Lawrence, the guy that created the show, and yep. he he saw a show at Largo, and he said, oh, "This is really good." He said, "I love these songs." He said, "Why do I not hear these songs on the radio?" And I said, "Fuck, that's a good question, right there." <laughs> and so he they would ha they, he liked Overkill, and so they used oh, yeah. a bunch they used a bunch of songs, and that was very very important for me. It, it uh, brought my average age of my audience down by about thirty years. Yeah. <laughs> And then and, it, you uh, ended up being in his Grammy award-winning soundtrack, The Garden well, State. Can we add correct. that he won a Grammy for basically making a mixtape? That's yeah. right. <laughs> yes, so, he did. Like, it's not like... Yes. He did. <laughs> he chose every damn song he as if he were making it. He made a sappy mixtape that you make for a girl that you like, and then he won a Grammy. That was a clever way to, clever way to make a to the make most a, successful to a mixtape yeah. yeah. ever. Wowzy zowie, kids! You know, oh. my, my seat could have been a little better. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta be honest. Uh, yeah, just spectacular. Honestly so and truly. Typical Jew complaint. <laughs> <laughs> Bing! Zing! Bang! Ah. Uh, well. <laughs> that certainly brings us to our next guest. Um, Holy dear Lord, that was spectacular. Um, yeah, Colin Hay. Just, uh, it makes more sense to do this, so then I can do that. All right. Uh, we've all heard the saying, he marches to a beat of his own drum. There is simply no more compelling argument or person, for that matter, who exemplifies that notion more. Please welcome Mr. Jeff Goldblum. Nice. It's a very powerful mic. Really? It'll pick you up from almost anywhere. No kidding. And who's and who's who's here? I Everyone. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Weirdly, we've invited just people who know who you are. Oh. <laughs> Look at you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? You're very very well. We're so glad you could join us. I'm thrilled. We've been talking about this for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and how did it happen? You were going to have me. Uh, at the other, but where do you do the other thing? We, and the other thing is always filmed? The other thing is streams live on the internet. Right. And then it's available afterwards on YouTube, iTunes, and Earwolf as but, a podcast, video or audio. Right. Uh, but not, but, not this. But not, this will be available audio only. Where? Uh, where because Flanagan where? refuses to let cameras in his theater. Ah, right. Yeah. And where is it available audio, man? I don't see how that's your business. <laughs> The, um, I, iTunes but it's, and, and Airwolf. And yeah. Airwolf. Yeah. But it's, it's special in some way. This is your seventh... Anniversary. Yeah, what seven years. Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. And I, I'm so thrilled that you could be a part of it because we want to do a, a long-form 90-minute, so this will be truncated, of course, to uh -huh. two hours. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, now, backstage, we were talking briefly. I asked, where have you come from? And, and, and in gathering that answer... You recall that you actually, uh, quite recently, were in Las Vegas. Yes. Um, I Is that what you meant? Where did you come from? Like just now, or in the last couple of days, or originally, or? I meant. That's what you from Pittsburgh. You meant a, Pittsburgh. Was it a long? <laughs> that's what you meant. Oh. I meant Not was really? it? A, I meant was it a long drive from where you live? Oh. But yes. No. We we have. Oh really? Let's oh. get to the Pittsburgh. I thought you meant in the last couple of days, where are you coming from? Da, 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 da. Oh no, I live in the same house that I've been for the last 29 years. I'm not going to say exactly the address, but somewhere in the Hollywood Hills, yeah. kind well, of behind the Chateau Marmont, in fact. Well, yeah, I, I'll give them the address. It's 1270. <laughs> no, luckily I've never been uh, harassed there. Well, I did have a stalker type. Uh, come. And then the other day I had a crazy, 
crazy guy kind of come, and he was kind of crazy. And then he was there on, on the, uh, kind of lying on my driveway the other night. Wait, wait. Yeah. Lying on the driveway. Yeah. I have kind of a, not much curb appeal, but I have a little bit of a, a bitty, bitty, a few bricks, you know, and then a kind of a thing. Don't, don't look for it. But... Um, <laughs> But uh, by the way, it's often been said about you that you have tremendous curb appeal. So don't C curb appeal. Yes, I do. Yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that. I'm drinking you in. Look at you. <laughs> Look, Look at, that. at you. Look at that tall drink of water. He has tremendous curb appeal. So thank Pittsburgh. You. Yes, Pittsburgh. That's what you really wanted to know about. Yes. Place. That's correct. We have uh, we have one on stage, and Jay Mack, who I mentioned earlier, also from the Berg of the Pits. Who, who, who? Uh, Jay Mack, our research producer and, and one of the producers on the show. Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but you had and you have tremendous fondness too. Yes, of course. When I first saw you at in San Francisco, my hometown, one of the other great cities, oh, yeah. um, at the uh, at the comedy festival, yeah. you were asking about the Pittsburgh uh, uh, score. They were in the playoffs. Oh, so were they? Seen, oh, during the game. Sort of dialed in. I am. I'm a Steelers yeah. fan. My dad, the doctor. <laughs> yeah, thank you. My dad was a doctor, and he was a passionate Steelers fan. In I was born in '52, and uh, we went so from you know from '50 whenever he could take me to the games. And he, we had four kids, but he took me. I was kind of his favorite in a way, and I was, I was a little bit sport. I was uh, you know I liked sports and I played sports, and then got really interested in it. And he took me to every uh, home game. Uh, they were then playing at uh, Forbes Field, where I'd seen Roberto Clemente play also uh, in the other part of the season, and uh, Pitt Stadium, all gone before I uh, graduated high school in 70. That's when they built Three Rivers and Terry Bradshaw, and they started to win. But these are all during the losing years. <laughs> But it was still fascinating. And then I kind of, uh, hippie style and uh, rebellious style, I sort of was against uh, football for a while, I think. Sure. Uh, militaristic and uh, Americana as it was. But then, boy, oh boy, you know, the apple falling from the tree in these last couple of decades, I've gotten the same addiction that my dad had, and I don't miss a snap. And I get too involved and too... Uh, obsessed and uh, uh, Emily, my wife of these now these four or five years, um, she's uh, sweetly watches the games with me. But when they lose, uh, I'm inconsolable, and I she's never I'm never like that in any other way. It's not even sad. Oh, it's dark. It's it's not even a good sad. It's no. it's bad. And she goes, Oh, I'm sorry they lost. What's the matter? You're not going to talk. What's the matter? You know, it's yeah. not even good. Anyway, Jamie, your sister has a little bit my of that. My sister's the same way, and yeah. my mother will be like, they better win just because I don't want her to be in a bad mood. Yeah, it yeah. changes everything. My yeah. brother, the it's Niner fan, patients in front of the TV cannot sit during the game. Can't sit. Oh, Not yeah. Possible. Nor do I have, ga nor do I have uh, parties or anything. No. I sit there. I don't want anybody, you know, fooling around. I watch the whole thing. I watch that whole thing because so I'm... Oh no! I'm yeah. with every snap. I'm with it, up or down. I rise and fall on every yeah. snap. Do you have any superstitions? Because my my sister has one where if they're not doing well, you have to change your outfit. Well, I try to avoid the narcissism that yeah. lets you think superstitiously, and I yeah. try to avoid superstition too that makes you think that I have anything to do with the outcome of the game, exactly. or does God or anything like that. No, <laughs> they're playing the game. Uh, but uh, but you know. But I do get myself up for it. I want to have the good energy. So on the day of the game, I, I, I make sure I sleep the night before and, and get up and work out. And oh, yeah, I don't want to be, da I don't want to you, be down. You make sure you sleep the night before. Yeah. Otherwise, that was debatable. If I'd sleep well, uh, getting, I'm still sleep training myself. Now that I have this nine month old child with, with, for whom sleep training is an issue and a big thing, I realize that I'm still sleep training myself. And, you know, it always changes, you know, and you need to keep going, geez, how do I get my good sleep and how do I do it best? Uh, yeah. Uh, have you, how are you with night shoots? Because I was talking with uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, was a recent guest on the show. Mm. And she and I. I know that, Jamie Lee Curtis. I saw her in that fabulous uh, gift store, OK. And she had, do you go there? Do you know I, I, her husband and you starred in a movie together? And I, it was both, of, well, you didn't star, you had very small parts. But you, you, <laughs> hey, really. been there, done that. But you, it was your first, it was both of your first movie. Oh, Death I Wish. know what you were saying. Oh, I thought you were referring to something else. Yes, yeah. our first movies, that's right. Yeah, he was like Officer O'Malley or some horrible thing. That's and you right. were, do you remember the, how your character was referred to? I sure do. In the credits? Yeah, you want to say it together? One, two, three. Freak number one. What happened? 
I, uh, I think me. everyone wanted to hear you say it. Freak number one. I thought we were going to be like uh, Butch and Sundance, uh, holding hands, <laughs> jumping right. off the cliff. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Freak number one. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so, but Jamie said, and I'm this, of the same mind. When you get a script, if it says uh, exterior night, yeah. if there are too many of those scenes, I'm not doing the movie. Uh, really? Because for folks who don't uh, know, every time or thought about it, every time you see a exterior a scene at nighttime, it was shot between usually 6 p.m. and 6 a.m., which yeah. means the entire cast and crew turn into vampires, and they sleep during the day, and they work just at night. They're yeah. the graveyard shift. Yeah, they know that. I haven't looked at it, but these are all show business people, aren't they? These are all... Don't I'm they know that? I'm also speaking or? to the world oh, the wor large, Of course, we have an audience. We have an audience. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but you really would turn a movie down because no, if Scorsese called you and said, "Hey, you're you're the star of you know all night." What's that movie? Why do you gotta go After to Scorsese? hours. Why do you got to go to Scorsese? Why well, can't because you? you starred in the Scorsese it. movie? You were fantastic. Well, I'm in, in eleven Scorsese minutes, movie. but still. Yeah, but those uh, there's no small parts. Only small. <laughs> Stanislavski would have said, "You, you, you." Those eleven minutes were. Well, you were the uh, the poster boy for no small parts uh, because, as everyone, many people know. One little beat in Annie Hall. One little tiny, you're on the phone for a second. One line, right? That's true, that's Wasn't true. Wasn't it just one line? It was. And you know, Chris Walken had the one scene in Annie Hall He was as brilliant, well. I love that scene. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chris Walken and I have been in four movies together, Let's true or false. Yeah. True or false, four. But we've never had a scene together, but we've come to know each other and, uh, you know. Yeah. That's right. true, that's all true. You love... <laughs> He started in the theaters, of course, boy. You love the theaters well. In fact, went home only a few years ago to Pittsburgh to do a production of... Yeah, The Music Man, Music Man. in order to make a movie of it, really. Yeah. Uh, but that was now like, it seems like a few years ago, but I think that Seven was... Seven or like eight, maybe? Something, something like yeah. that. Time yeah. flies, yeah. Uh, but you were saying that you okay had the little You're okay with the night line. shoots and the tra training yourself well, to sleep. Well, it's not easy. That's what the original, that's where we originally started this, and I, it, I have to work on it. I think a good night, a good day's work is uh, much accomplished the night before when you get that By good sleep. night's sleep. That's melatonin. What are you using? What do you do? Uh, that's very interesting. Um, <laughs> so you know, I so saw the night shoots. I've done. I did that movie uh, Into the Night, and that was like all weeks and weeks of a night shoot. It right so, there in the title. Yeah, it does. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's not even page one. You should know ahead of time. That's correct. But I wouldn't have turned that down. No, that's not one of there are tough. You know, if you're doing the Revenant, I mean, you know, would you turn that down because of the difficult yes, conditions? Yes, yeah, yes, really. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, they didn't maybe. ask the 58-year-old Jew to be in the Revenant. All right. I'd like to have seen you in that, sleeping in that horse. I would like to. Be in that. So, but yeah. Oh, you know, if I'm to be honest, and we should have an honest discussion about Please. this. Well, melatonin. Yeah, I've tr I've tried. I've tried it. I w still will try it. And then I found this thing, the halfway. You know. A uh, little drug that's a little more serious, and you get a prescription. But they swear, my doctors swear, it's not. Uh, there's no danger, there's no risk, and it's not habit forming. Is Sonata uh, that you take halfway through? You know, because when you wake up in the middle of the night, like I do, oftentimes, and kind of might not get back to sleep. You really need to get that second four hours, uh, Sonata. But now, recently, in the last couple of months. <laughs> I have. Is that by Hyundai? Who makes the Sonata? Sonata. <laughs> but, I, but now I've sworn off. I don't like it. As a matter of fact, I keep experimenting. To, a couple of nights ago, I thought, I really need a good night's sleep because I just got back from a trip Las to Vegas. Vietnam. No, oh, well, before, before Las Vegas, the, uh, just a few days before, we got back from Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, and Brunei. I'll tell you all about that if Please. you want. But it's, I, I, it's uh, you know, changing your sleep cycle and all that, it's not so easy. And I have to be, I have to, you know, be on my game. Yeah. Otherwise, I could be, mo you know, you, you should see me when I'm tired. Well, oddly, let's roll the clip. <laughs> okay, show of hands. Who has any idea what the hell is going on? <laughs> well, anyway, I thought uh, I'd rely back on the drugs, but then I got up. I was groggy. I was groggy. So I, I'm swearing them off again. I don't think, I think on the natch is the best way. On the natch is the correct answer. I, yes, that's yes. That's right. Okay. Also a name I wrestled under in the 70s. Now listen, uh, I'm gonna jump around a little bit. You must jump around. Yeah, For, uh, one of the first things I need to know, Yeah. 
please, uh. anything you wish to share about filming the Grand Budapest Hotel. Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, well, little, you know, I'll tell you anything. German you... town, right? Yeah, uh, Ger Gerlitz, Germany, right on the uh, right on. I wasn't aware of it, but it's right on the border of Poland. There, just and... off the I five, I think. <laughs> yeah, you go down the the, the 101. The um, <laughs> The, uh, and it's right on the border, and we had a lovely, you know, wonderful Wes Anderson winter wonderland time of it. He, like I think Robert Altman, and uh, uh, likes to make an art piece out of the experience of making the movies. So we all kind of got into this wonderful villa there, and, and all of us together, all, we exclusively had this place. And he had a cook to make us dinners every night, and we, we all ate together. You know, that cast, too. Some of us came and went, and but it was just a lovely... A lovely time. So you would go down to breakfast, and in his pajamas would be Ray Fiennes. Well, Ray Fiennes, and you know, and uh, uh, um, um, Willem Dafoe, sure. you know, was staying down the hall and playing his guitar, and we'd have breakfast together. That's correct. That's right. <laughs> and, and it was all, and he, and when all the uh, the locations were within a couple of blocks of the thing, so we'd hang out there until okay, we we need you, you know, let's go do your scene. You know, it was very well organized. Now I know what I. I couldn't be more of a fan, honestly and truly. Thanks. Uh, of uh, not just yours, but of Wes Anderson. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think all of us who are fans love his uh, composition and how extraordinarily important, and I'm assuming rehearsed all, all the beautiful moves like uh, uh, choreography. And I, I, you mentioned Scorsese. He, he is also uh, sick, crazy, focused, dialed in on the composition. But within that composition, the actors were 100% free to do mm -hmm. whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. That does not seem to be the case at all that's with Wes. That's correct. Um, <laughs> it's different. Although there's an inner freedom. He loves actors. is very sophisticated and refined about your process. And, and, and at the same time, he has written this script with a very meticulous, you know, and creator of a doll's house sense, yeah. like people say, about the visuals and stuff. So even uh, though I'd been very well uh, uh, conscientiously rehearsed on some of these couple of big speeches that I had in that... Uh, big. Uh, yeah, I know. I had, I had recrafted, tweaked for myself, just one... I, I literally I changed a, an and to a the no. or I said yeah because I thought because I had a real not just mistakenly or accidentally right. I I had thought about it and came to I, I it made more sense to me I thought it was better I liked the music and then I came and sure enough I started to do it on the day and he said yeah that was very good say um are you changing? Uh, I think you changed. I think you changed the name. There, that. Yes, I did. Uh, I'm not surprised that you noticed that. But here's my explanation. I told him he, because of this that he says, "Yeah, I get you. I get you. Keep keep the keep it the other way. Do, do it the other way. Do it the way I wrote it." Yeah. So he's very meticulous. So you have a very kind of uh, particular thing. And on that we did like. Uh, you know, lots and lots of takes, for instance. Uh, but he's very creative. And then he would say, like I think somebody else had said before him who he admired, uh, okay, that's it, that's it, that's good. Let's try it now within that. Let's do it, do it this. And, he, and the little detailing would be a lot of fun. And then this, as I say, inner freedom. And then, uh, and then he'd say, well, uh, that was good, that was good. Well, now just for pleasure. Just one for you. One now for one fun. just for pleasure. Now another one just for pleasure. There you go. Yeah. And now let's leave. And that, that was it. It was, he's just wonderful. But you were saying, oh, yeah, yeah. No, but, but in that movie uh, particularly, he since Fantastic Mr. Fox, if you really want to talk love, a, love, a little love, bit love, inside love, love, baseball, yes, since please. then he had come even more to prepare uh, pre specifically, uh, um, such that on this he had a what he called a uh, previs, or an, an, uh, animatics. animatics. Yeah. He had a, a, a drawing a nifty but kind of simple little drawing of all the scenes, motion drawing, a little animated version of the scenes um, uh, with which he would voice all the parts. For Budapest? Yep. And so you could see, you could see, yeah, you could see if you wanted the whole movie with him playing all the parts. Uh, There's no way a shrink could help him. Well, he's acting the, every part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he'd written That's it, and it, yeah, and he had a sense of the orchestration and the symphonic kind of musicality of the whole thing, and the kind of screwball tempo rhythm of it. And he'd give you a list. He's a teacher. He's a great archivist and cinema f teacher. You know, he'd give you a a, a, a uh, 
stack of movies, if you wanted, to watch them that inspired uh, that movie and from which he'd taken bits of it. And incredible so it was a, tools. Yeah, incredible, incredible tools. Some method kind of actors went, oh, I don't want to see anybody else do my line, but, you know, they say even Stanislavski gave line readings, in fact. Uh, and me, who, what do I know, little, little me that I am, I, I'm fine with anybody. I, go, I, I like to go, how, what, what, give me all, all the information yeah. you want. You yeah. wrote it. How do you hear it? How right. do you see it? Good. I get all that. Now I can make it my own, et cetera, et cetera. You're still going to make it your own. Well, I, think, I, I feel that I can. No, no. I, I, there are very, I said this in the opening. It's true, though. You, there are very few artists who can truly be one of a kind, no matter what the material is. Very few. Honestly, if you had to pick one, the, someone who inspired you or you admired, who no matter what the material was, they made it their own. Because uh -huh. it's a rare thing. It's, it's not as obvious as it may sound, yeah. how to make something your own. Right, right. Uh, I feel like a facilitator most of the time. I do understand the musical rhythms of the writer and mm -hmm. want to facilitate that. Yeah, and then there are times when I'll have freedom to to not just improvise, but come up with a very specific beat that makes sense to me, right? right? So yeah. you try it to make it your own. But I, I in going over the research and, and some, uh, most of the body of the work, it, yeah. there is a very specific choice on it, seemingly, on everything you're doing. Well, I like to work in, and I'm still a humble student. I'm a late bloomer, and I like, uh, luckily, because it keeps me very on the threshold of my most interested and appetized moment, uh, to tell you the truth, and, um, and uh, I like to do a lot of different work different ways, and I've liked to on stage do, you know, the Mammoth or something, or these movies, and I think uh, the Coen brothers, with whom I've never worked, work the same way, in a very kind of meticulous thing, and you know, you do a play, you've got to say the lines just as it is, and then make them seem as though they're improvised, but I, so I like to do that. And as you know, eight times a week, you can detail and, and kind of work in a particular way, craft-wise. Uh, but I also like to do all, you know, I like to improvise entirely and have no, nothing planned out. Where does and, that come from? You know, Portlandia, I like to do Portlandia and all those things, and I've done movies like that. I, or do a hybrid of it, where they say, okay, do, you know, you got another joke, do, do another one, and kind of tell her a different joke this time, or, you know, something like that. Where does your love for the improv come from? Well, um, I studied with Sandy Meisner early on. Now everybody teaches this Meisner so-called method, but I was lucky enough to study with him at the Neighborhood Playhouse right after high school in 1970 in New York when he was there. And his, the, the, um, uh, the uh, signature part of his two-year training program is really his, that early um, improvisation that he, teaches that many people, I think, misteach or misunderstand. They call it repetition and da-da-da-da. Anyway, he teaches an improvisation uh, at the beginning. Right. Uh, that is uh, 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 that I got very excited about and I'm still excited about. It forces you to go deeper into the character when you have to think as that character. I've always done impersonations in my stand-up act, and what happens is it becomes a possession for me in that when doing Albert Brooks, I will actually think faster and funnier in his tone and voice than in my own thoughts. Yeah. And I would think that would be true to this acting, because you've taught acting as well many, many times. I, li I like yeah. to, in order to learn it more fully and completely, I think, uh, and I like acting, it just feels good to, it feels healthy. It's not like something, oh, I'm giving, I'm doing something, um, sacrificial or uh, broccoli, you know. I, I actually like to do it. I, after a class, I can Just teach... a second, I have to write down sacrificial or broccoli. Hold on. <laughs> That's the name of my autobiography. Did you read that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, I could teach a class every day. I just like to teach. I really do like to teach. And because and, it really takes the that uh, trap, the inherent trap of G's of narcissism or self-consciousness or I'm putting, I'm trying to cut the mustard or put my best foot forward. When you're really trying to go, geez, what can I do to impact and otherwise nourish, awaken and uh, excite and clarify for that guy over there? That's, that, that's nice. And it, it, it feels good. And I feel like I learned from it. Gee, I didn't know I knew that, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go home still buzzing with it. Oh, boy. You know, very excited about it. Whereas acting, even to this day, it can be very exciting. But sometimes I'll be stricken and go home. Ah, what, what did I do? And, and all that stuff, you know, second guessing. But what was I going to say? Well, I started to say something. <laughs> Something about, no, 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 te you said teaching, we were talking about... Being in the moment, improvising. Oh, ah, and thinking in the thing. <laughs> right. Well, that, 
that um, the improvisation isn't yet character work, which is a little more Stella Adler, uh, coincident. Uh, this improvisation is really kind of find your own voice right. more, right. rather than even characterizing yet. Um, you know what I mean, Jelly Bean, and, and kind a... of being open, being present, being present. I won't bore you with the whole thing, but but two but two things just for just from where every good actor is is is, is working anyway is just being present, you know, and receptive uh, uh, to uh, and alert. Uh, and attentive to whatever is in the go moment. going on and interested. That's right. And then open in response to it right. in your own unique w uh, way. Uh, here's how I feel about it in word or deed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like I need that. to know what's happening Well, here. You, I wrote this down when I thought, even a couple of months ago when I thought we were going to, because I... I, I I don't know that I've heard, and you brought it up, so I, I'm, I'm, I'll bring it up. I, I love, I'm a sucker, as I told you, for, improv, for, for um, impersonations. Can you do a little Albert Brooks? There's someone, there's someone who, there's a couple of people who do you. I've seen Elon, Elon Gold, Gold do me. Elon I saw Gold. David Duchovny on Saturday Night Live. That's a funny version of me. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple, <laughs> there's a couple of people who do well, me. Well, people have asked me if I did an impression of you, and, and I, I'm going to listen back to this interview until I have it because... You are, you're, it's so unique, it's so specific that, it, yeah, that, that's all you need to sort of a, a dial in an impersonation. I'm going to teach you now to do Liam Neeson. Are you, are you ready? <laughs> Liam Neeson. Yeah. Liam Neeson, And okay. I didn't think to ever do him, ever, until I was driving in my car. Yeah. Jamie had given me a, a list for Trader Jim's, as I like to call it. And um, I, I was trying to go through the list in my mind, and one of the items was... Bananas, and as I thought of it, I looked in the rearview mirror and I said, "Bananas." <laughs> I don't know why. Bananas. That's bananas. 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 <laughs> bananas. Hey, that's good. I don't know why. I got it. You ever see him? You know what I like him in. You ever see that uh, episode of Extras? Is it Extras yes. that he appears on oh, so with good. Stephen Merchant and uh, <laughs> and Ricky? Yeah. I want to do comedy. I want to do comedy. Yeah, and Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant. Um, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's very funny. I like him doing that. I've met him. He's a sweet guy. He's a very sweet guy. And a 63-year-old action big. hero, which gives oh, hope to all. He's 63 now? I'm guessing. Oh. <laughs> he's big. He's big. What a sweet guy. You said that with so much confidence. Like you actually <laughs> I did. You oh, can I can also, sell it. You know what? You can also teach him um, Jason Statham. Oh, yes. Very easy one word impression. Do you want it? She's so correct. Do you want it? Well, that's the, she's the head writer on the show. Now you see why. Do you want to You're see? Uh, so, two syllables. Yeah. He says six words. Jason Statham, the British action hero from yes. the Snatch movies and the. T right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and now many, many <laughs> endless films. Snatch of movies, plural. Sna <laughs> the Snatch movies. Yeah. Snatch? Yeah. Way to live up to aged Jew. Are they not all one film? I misunderstood. So he says, and it's very British. It's not just him. It's very, do you know what I mean? Six words. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He reduces it to two syllables. Yeah. And those two syllables are domain. Do you know? <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. mean? You're really saying. Do you know what I mean? Do you mean? Do you mean? Do you mean? Yeah. That's good. I think me and Joe Green. Me and Joe Green, yeah. Huh? Hey, what is that line? Because that's very good. What is that line that uh, Richard Dreyfus says? I don't know if you do Richard Dreyfus, but what is that line that Richard Dreyfus says in the middle of uh, What About Bob? I love that movie. Where, he, where he's finally at his wit's end, almost, almost to the culminative point, and he has... Uh, Bob in the car and he's driving him and, he, and then he goes around opens the door so and he says get out of the car <laughs> it's, the, it's get out of the car but it's, yeah. get out of the car. Yeah. it's one syllable yes. really yes. right I mean, that's the that's thing that's what made you me you've got to find those little moments and dial them in that's perfect that's a perfect Richard Dreyfus. well I don't <laughs> no, know, it never is. Better than that. I did a movie with Richard Dreyfuss, True or, True or False. True. What movie would that be? It's called... Nobody, nobody knows. I don't know if this was... Oh, it was released, but very tinyly. Did inserts? Tiny. Not inserts, no. Oh, Not inserts. Good. I saw that when it first came out in yeah. New York. That was 71 or something before yeah. I was making movies. You know who's in that is, I can never remember her name. What's that lovely girl who is in Stardust Memories, I do believe? Who? 
J- 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 what? Now it's the... Jessica uh, so Harper. Jessica What's her Harper. first name? Jessica Harper. Jessica Harper. She's wonderful in that. Is she in that movie? <laughs> you, know, you know who... Oh. You know who might be in that movie is my co-star in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, uh, Veronica Cartwright. Is that true? That is true. Really? Yes. I knew it was something, so maybe it's her. Listen. Okay. Welcome back to the IMDb game. We are... um, (laughs) We're just playing now with Jeff Goldblum. Um, So so you asked for Albert Brooks. Listen, Jeff. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of movies. Oh, these are good. All right. Wait a second. Uh, Jamie, uh, here on stage, horrified as what, seven, eight years old? Oh, I was much younger than younger that. Younger than that. Probably four. Five or her five. family let her watch The Fly when she's four. <laughs> it was an That's accident. fantastic. Albert Brooks, I love those first few movies because oh, I love real life. Uh, modern romance is. Modern the one romance. For me. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Popularity, Mr. Popularity, Petey, <laughs> Alan, Alan, Petey. <laughs> Bruno Kirby, my friend, you know, you took the quaaludes. You took the quaaludes. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Did you take a lewd? Come on, Jay. Give me a little credit. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. And they go into, and then finally, what do you think I was doing? Fucking those men? What do you you show up? Don't don't, don't show up where you work. Where were they? Where did they shoot that scene? Catherine Harold uh, is the actress. Yeah, what location here in Los Angeles? Which Asian restaurant? Yes. it's now, it's now, what, what, what do they call it now? Then it became Roxbury. Now it's... Uh, oh, right. I- Imagi, Imagi, Imagi. Or, uh, Amugi, yeah. sure. Amugi. <laughs> Imperial Gardens. Imperial Gardens, of course. You don't remember that? Oh, what a lovely place that was. Oh, uh, yeah, Catherine Harold. Yeah. Is there any she way... Says, he says in that, he says, uh, whoa, whoa, she's going to work. Whoa, whoa. We've we, <laughs> we got we some gotta, hemming to do. We've got to do some knitting, some sewing. sewing. Your yeah. nipples look like eyeballs. There are people Hon- out there who just bludgeon. That's all they do. <laughs> that's all they do. Okay, honey, you do. Honey, there are men out there that rape. That's all they do. <laughs> that's right. That's what that's he says. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. He goes deeper than bludgeon. He actually It's so says good, rape. The art word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's so good. Remember the final song over the end credits? Please. No, don't you remember it? Nobody remembers it. You are, it's, jo, it's Joe Cocker singing, You are oh, so course. beautiful right. to me, can't you see? Yeah, that's good. This brings us to the question, when did you uh, decide or did your parents decide you were going to learn the piano? Well, they didn't decide, but they offered us all four kids piano lessons, and then a couple fell away from that. One picked up the clarinet. Nothing ever took with them. My sister stayed with the piano a little bit. I taught her because I saw Pete Bar Beauty on the Merv Griffin show. And the Tonight Show, Johnny Love. Yeah, play with his nose, the piano with his nose. I'm remembering right. So I taught her. I do the, and to this day, I can do the bottom part. To, if you knew Susie, like she, like I knew Susie, and she does bang, 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 bang with her nose. Yes. <laughs> But she plays a little. Now she plays the ukulele a little, and uh, she's very good. But I stuck with the piano uh, after some lessons, and I didn't know the joys of discipline yet. And so the guy would come once a week, and I'd go, oh, I didn't really practice, and I wish he wouldn't come, and da 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 until he handed me a jazzy piece of music, and I went, I, 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 I love that. I got to sit and learn how to play Alley Cat or Stairway to the Stars, and that's when I started to get a little better, and that's when I started to like the piano. And do you feel, once again, getting back to improv... Mm. In playing piano, that's when you have your own voice as a pianist, is when you start improvising during a jazz number or anything. I liked it. I wouldn't say I had my own, found my own voice, or even now have my own voice musically. You know, no, that's uh, to claim, no, 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 no. I, you know, when you see, when you hear, when you turn to the, uh, when you hear a record of Thelonious Monk, or you, hear, you go, that's Thelonious Monk. No, I don't know that I found any particular your interesting. Own Let's call it your own thoughts. Well, I, I, I interest myself, yes. I certainly was <laughs> happy to play myself, and I play, yeah, you now I play what I kind of want to play, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we uh, Sketch Fest in San Francisco is where Jamie and I saw you and Who your learns? band. Who yeah. learns? Uh, what, what, who, who? <laughs> I'm glad the guy yeah, and I play every week festival. if I'm here in town at Rockwell. Uh, you're invited to come to Rockwell, which yeah, we, is in we Los Feliz. We went to you know? at Rockwell with the group as well. Yeah, yeah. The name of the band? The Mildred Snitzer Orchestra. Because? Uh, because the, we played the Playboy Jazz Festival, believe it or not, some years ago, and they were going to put us in the program before then, We'd gone under the radar without purposely any name or advertisement, and they said, "You got to, we got to work and put you on the program." And I said, "Well, 
hey, I knew this lady who was a friend of the, uh, I've gotten gassy. Why am I so gassy? Don't, don't make this I, as, I promise put, I will build it into the impersonation. No, you got to cut that, that part out. very slow sort of belch that comes up during the... <laughs> Jamie, can I guess why you said Boo Earns? Because I said Sketchfest and one of the creators of Sketchfest, Cole Stratton is in the audience. I had a, I had a, I had a boom. Okay, that's correct. All right, just checking. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, so you, you had a great time at Sketchfest with the group, right? I mean, it's a... It's a we did, yeah. yeah. With the Miller Sister Orchestra. Yeah, we did. That was we, fun. We saw you perform, and you will play a song, and then you'll do this thing where the um, true or false, it becomes a much bigger part of the show. Yeah, and, uh, I, and you know, it, it and seems, I, don't, I don't prepare anything. Right. You know, our friend John Mastro gives me these things. I like to, I read cold. I also say, hey, did, did I do it that night? I started to do this. I, I don't do it as a routine, but I say, does anybody have their device uh, upon which they have an exchange of texts between you and somebody else that they want me to do a cold and dramatic reading of. <laughs> but, and people seem to like the idea, and then they go, yeah, yeah, do this, and sometimes it's interesting, sometimes it's not. Sammy, so see that. if you can find someone uh, in the audience in the front row here well, if who, you might, do, you know, who might cough up a, be happy a, a to do that. text And then, and then my friend gives me these cold things to read, you know. And, yeah. uh, like a, and we play the movie game. I do like to, I think that is a conversational lubricant, isn't it? I mean that, it's not only just what we're talking about, but if you, you, but somebody starts, they name an actor or the name of a movie. Go ahead, name an actor or a movie. I'll just do it for a second. I won't take over the Bird thing, Lancaster. So Bird Lancaster, now we have to think of a movie that he's been in. So you know that brings us to Atlantic City. You know who I just saw the other day? This is kind of Susan part of the game. Sarandon. Is Why Susan Sarandon. Yes, I did. I did. spoke to her in uh, CinemaCon. So Susan Sarandon takes us to another movie of hers. Dead Man Walking. Dead Man Walking takes right. us to, I mean, I guess most easily Sean Penn. So you're going to do uh, a Sean cold Penn reading. This will be a dramatic to, reading. Okay, so who's Anna? Who, who's Anna? You're Anna. Uh, you're, you're Anna. You're Anna. Your Anna sent this to you, and you're, she's in the, in the gray? Or, you're the, you're the, Whatever uh, the color is that's he, not me. Anna's he's the gray, said. he's the blue. And what's, you're the blue, and what's he's your, what's your name? He's the blue, and Anna is in the not blue. What's your name? Mastro. Settle down. <laughs> your name is Ma Moscow? Moscow? Mastro. My dad's from Pittsburgh. He's Mastro. 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 So, so Mas... They know it because they can hear you, sir. <laughs> so Mastro... Mas Joe says Notice to... Notice I'm not even asking why you have that fucked up name, Mas Joe. Mas Joe, Mas Joe. M-O-S-S-J-O-E, Mas As it Joe. turns out, I, we have your phone. We... Yeah, it was M -A -S -J -O. driven past the point of possibly Mas caring, I promise you. So let's get to the dramatic reading. The dramatic reading goes like this. Mas Joe says, how was SNL? Anna says, amazing. I love Julie Louis-Dreyfus. I was watching Veep last night in honor and isn't it so good? You should watch the opening and the monologue from last night. Will do. And yeah, it's like the third time I'm watching beep, then asterisk veep. <laughs> Was Tony in the audience? Holy shit, Larry David. Ha ha, right, ha ha. The skits weren't great, but JLD is amazing. She's the best, so excited, but, B-U-T-T. Have fun, but, B-U-T-T, -T, getting pumped with Christian rock. Sounds fun. Not fun? Christian rock? Mm, I'm more of a misogynist, crime-filled rap kind of girl. <laughs> and she maybe, wrote that? Yeah, she, yeah. And maybe we should end it there, but there you go. Yeah, very, yeah. very good. Very good. So you see how... Delightful that is. Yeah. Susan Saran. Oh, Sha Sean so, Penn takes to. I am Sam. I am Sam. You and Michelle I are, Pfeiffer. You and I into are the night. Jeff Featured in a. <laughs> there you go. Full circle. You and I are featured <laughs> in the same film. Well, I was gonna. I was. I, I looked. I was I gonna saw. say we appear in the same film because I don't appear in it. Ike. It's you, my voice. Your voice only. as Eisenhower. Eisenhower in. The right stuff. The right stuff. Yes. So, uh, I just saw Harry Shearer on that boat trip to oh, Vietnam, really? and yes. Okay, so we're going to get to that in a second. Philip Kaufman, the great director of The Right Stuff. Terrific. San Francisco San guy. Francisco. I'm there as a stand-up, and the, and the word hits the community, or a few of us who do voices. Uh, they got an actor who looks exactly like Eisenhower, and he sounds like a duck, so we need to have someone <laughs> do Eisenhower's voice. Right. Well, I'm old, but I'm not that old, so I said, I don't know what he sounds like, and they, we have a tape for you to listen to. And it sounded just enough like Clark Gable that I could kind of bend it a little and say, the first American in space is not going to be a chimpanzee. 
Yeah. And that is in a film that you star in. Well, star, no, I have a very, very small part in it, but that sounded like what I remember of uh, Eisenhower sounding like. Uh, now, but I, I you wonder... do a full, uh, you know, you do a full, uh, you yeah. need to be kissed and kissed often by somebody who knows how. <laughs> there uh, you go. Yeah, no, that, that's good. I have a pop quiz for you. Can what? I get you some water, by the way? Uh, no, this was... More uh, coffee? No, I should, I should hydrate. Now that I've had coffee too close to my bedtime, by the way, speaking this of... This is why we the, have a problem with the men melatonin not Melatonin, men 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 Mennonites. I should have... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should hydrate with water. Now wash this caffeine out of my system. Mennonites at work, by the way, not as good. Can we get a bottle of water, please, from backstage? What a clever man, what a um, clever man. I have a pop quiz for you. What Shoot. was the, uh, I'm going to say liquid or uh, viscosity therein, that you and Harry were allegedly throwing up over the side of the boat in the right stuff? Oh, you know, a... Uh, like mushroom know. soup? Yeah, mushroom soup or oatmeal and, you know, oatmeal, you know. <laughs> also very close to the Dreyfus impression. All right, let's... <laughs> hey, you were in Willow, too. Technically. Hey, what's the... Uh, I just saw Bryce Dallas Howard at this CinemaCon. Hey, what, um, what was the, the line? What do you call it on a, on a one sheet, on a poster where they go, you know... How did they explain the movie Willow in a one line? Well, it, it was the weird... As I remember, I don't disparage publicly anything in show business, but and I'm not disparaging, but I, I remember I was struck by that. He said, forget everything you've... I don't know it. Forget Something, everything you've heard. Remember what you, you don't Sam, know right. and then throw out a couple of things that you thought you were thinking about or something like that. Uh, something that, ah, oh, bless your heart, thank, thank you. you Sammy. Something that was uh, supposed to be magical, you know, but uh, <laughs> Canadian bacon you were in. How about that? The only fictional I, movie. I, I have to say, if there is some way to do like a being John Malkovich where I can be inside your head for just 10 minutes, I would pay a million fucking dollars to do that. Well, the thing is beautiful also is the, the you, you are uh, accustomed to and open with your thought process that then becomes fascinating. It's true. So let's talk uh, quickly, if we can, please. Anything. Uh, you don't because even have to ask, please, there's something coming this summer yes. that is a sequel yes. to a film yes. Uh, yes. called Independence Day. Yes. Oh. Yeah. I thought it was Earth Girls Are Easy, too. Not Earth Girls Are Easy, Not. too. No, that's... But that has its fans. Earth Girls Are Easy it, as well. Um, yeah. So, so you, you've had Independence Day, uh, uh, the fanship coming up to you for, for, for so many years. The phone rings, and how is it pitched to you, explained to you uh, to do the sequel? Roland Emmerich, do you know him? The or original you, filmmaker. Yeah, you ever meet him? You ever see him talk? Technically, he's a, he's let's a, just say no. He's a very, <laughs> very sweet German with a German accent uh, guy. Uh, very sweet. He called, or Dean Devlin, who created the movie with him. Very nice guy, if you know him. Uh, creative guy. They made the first one. Then they called a few years ago and said, hey, we, uh, we think, we, can we have dinner with you? We want to take you to dinner. We have uh, an idea for this sequel, and you've got a good part in it, and we, we want to tell you the movie. Yeah, absolutely. That was it. And then they took me and Emily came along. We just sort of gotten together. This is now three, four years ago. Uh, to Boa. Uh, you know, where's Boa? The steak. I had a nice sure. steak. And, uh, and he told me the movie, essentially, what, what you're going to see. Medium rare season. plus, I'm going to guess. Sometimes. I just, or we order from Pache a lot. And I ordered my oh. usual medium rare the other day. It was too red. It was too red. Some people's version of medium rare can be. Medium rare plus, you want to go with it really? Yeah. I should, You like pink, I? not red? We've gotten off the track. <laughs> <laughs> no. Maybe we shouldn't so, eat, eat meat at all. I don't know. I mean, so, I'm... I'm uh, so oh. how else are we going to remind the cows that we're in control? <laughs> Explain it to them? So, uh... Yeah, but there was a whole thing on this boat. Paul Allen, you know, had this boat trip, and he's very into the elephants and saving the elephants. Oh, it's a bad thing. We saw this document, heartbreaking documentary. Yeah. Speaking of which, the, the Ch China is the one violator now, uh, particularly, of buying um, ivory. And so they kill these beautiful beasts for their ivory. Give so us we must not... So bypass... Yeah. If you know what? Chi anybody in China, bypass the... Bypass the ivory products yes, please to to recap ivory bad china okay nothing wrong with china but we nothing all are learning we're china. we've got plenty to learn ourselves boy we should talk about give all me a little of the, the paul allen let's go to the little bit of the paul allen trip well, so this I, has I, happened like three times but there's also an, an almost annual retreat in the woods 
thing. Maybe. I'm not but part of that. This is a I've boat. only been part of these big uh, few hundred people invited on a big cruise. It must be a, just a ginormous it's vessel. Fantastic. Yeah, it is. You know, I'd never been on a cruise besides that. Have you? You must have. But this can't be, you know, the princess cruise. We're talking about a boat with a helicopter and a thing and a and chef. It's and a, a, big. Uh, uh, you know, I don't know cruise ships, but it's great big. It's great big. It's big and like a five-star hotel kind of. And with a, a butler is on your floor. And he, Just like the Princess Cruise. Yeah. Is that, is that not, nope. is not the Princess Cruise. No. But apparently there's some bigger. I mean, if you go on the Queen Mary, it's people said, oh, you know, if you've ever been on the Queen Mary, there's, there's even In Long Beach? fancier. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'd never been. I'd avoided it. I don't, although we had a, true or false, we had a shuffleboard court in our backyard in true. Pittsburgh. That is true. Because my parents, my dad, the Jewish doctor in the 50s and the 60s, you know, he went with uh, the chair news on a cruise and they'd play shuffleboard. And then they'd come over once a week and they'd play bridge for, for heaven's oh, sakes. Oh, no, you know. not the bridge. Yeah, it's true. So, so uh, well, Paul Allen, it, you know, it's fantastic. I had gone to Alaska. I'd Who's on to, the boat? Well, <laughs> give us a few. I have, I could have brought the whole list and I, I it's not, you know, uh, out of bounds to tell tales, but here are the people... There's, you know, Quentin Tarantino is sure. on the boat, and Jim Sheridan, who directed My Left Foot, and, uh, you know, uh, in the name of the Father. And um, Tom Stoppard, for God's sake. And um, this wonderful, so well, Jim Watson, uh, who discovered DNA along with Francis Crick, whom I played in a movie, Jim Watson. I'd, know, I'd gotten to know him over the years a little bit. He'd been very nice, and then I saw him again. It was his 88th birthday. And uh, he said, oh, hello again, da 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 yes, I like that movie that you did with me, although I didn't want you to play me originally, you know. I said, oh, okay. Uh, he said, no, I wanted John McEnroe. <laughs> I was, okay, okay, oh, that sounds fine to me. And then I told somebody else, they said, I think he might be a little, maybe he meant John Malkovich. <laughs> I went back. And he said, no, 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 I you remember there were those couple of scenes where the young Jim Watson was playing tennis? I meant John McEnroe. I'd like, I thought he would have been good. <laughs> And then I told that story to Tom Stoppard, and he said, oh, yeah, geez, I I'd like to see all your parts done by John McEnroe, you know. <laughs> and then the end of my chunk that I kept thinking of in the middle of the night is, oh, yeah, he would have gone, I forgot my mantra, you cannot be serious. <laughs> Life will find a way. You cannot be serious. <laughs> I don't know. Is that the end of the chunk? You know better than I do. I the, that's the button. That's the beautiful, beautiful really? button. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, what are you looking at from the back of the Jeep? Forgive me if you've been asked six million times. I really do need to know. A stick with a... No, a, 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 a tennis yeah. ball. I don't want to hear that, please. That's it. That's it. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. Half the time, sometimes Stan Winston, uh, Oliver Sholom, is, uh, did with the Oscar winning... Also uh, hanging from a string off a... Of puppetry. No, he, he made these things that for all the world look like they're real dinosaurs, uh, but half the time it was that early uh, and successful pioneering version of CGI. And what are you seeing in your mind? Did, you, did they show you... Uh, Stephen show you storyboards? Anything of what the dinosaur might look like? You know, uh, it's not like um, the animatics that Wes did, but for one sequence I remember only the one where the T-Rex is chasing the thing and, and I say can, hey come on and chase you can me. hear Stephen going ah! yes he would do that he had a kind of a claymation stop motion version of it that we saw on the set oh that's what oh god right 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 and well, now we're doing that angle and that shot okay did a part of you want to say but Stephen it'll look better than that right well uh, yes yes, yes <laughs> yeah I assumed it would but yeah how about that oh man how about that? Um, yeah. uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to get together and do a longer version, but for this version, oh, I'm so sad. would you maybe play? A I, I'll sure, sure I will. So, but next time, we, we want to talk about Buffalo 66. Yes. We want to talk about the aristocrats. I, you know, the, well, I want to see you. I've never seen you do Alan Arkin. Well, let me ask you a question, and then you're going to play piano. Do you know Adam, his son? I do a little bit because technically he came out of my penis. But let me say... <laughs> That's a gift for you. Now, please. I will. Here I go. And then the next time, Gabriel Byrne, with whom I did a movie, True or False? True. Yes, it is. The same one that I did with Dreyfus. I never told you what it was. It's called Trigger Happy or Mad Dog Time. Mad Dog Time. You know when they give you two titles, they're in trouble. <laughs> Paul Reiser. Paul Reiser. I never... And then finally... Oh, we shattered. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Today's ad, today we're sponsored by the fine folks at Howl.fm. What the fuck are you talking about, you ask? It's like Netflix for podcasts. 
With HAL Premium, you get exclusive access to a brand new HAL original comedy series like The Mysterious Secrets of Uncle Bertie's Botanarium, starring Jermaine Clement of Flight of the Concords. Now, we've done these ads a couple of times. Folks, I don't know what the fuck you're waiting for. It, it's, this opportunity is absolutely uh, kind of amazing. Because if you're a comedy fan and you're tuning in to Earwolf, and you're not a part of HAL FM, if I may, you're an asshole. How's that, for, how's that for pressure? Um, please redeem the promo code. Make sure you create your own account on the web at howl.fm. The promo code, I know, hard to imagine. Kevin, K-E-V-I-N. It's weird how they're all uh, personalized when you hear this ad read by other shows. Remember to hear the mysterious secrets of Uncle Bertie's Botanarian along with dozens of original audio miniseries. Go to howl.fm. How about Mark Marin's library? That's where you're going to go. All the archives from WTF. Mark Marin on all the Earwolf shows like Comedy Bang Bang, How Did This Get Made? They're all at Howl.fm. Over 120 hours of new original shows and audio documentaries like The Complete Woman, Finding the Funny with the Sklar Brothers, and Fruit. More than 80 comedy albums. I, I have to ask, what the fuck are you waiting for? Howl.fm. Promo code Kevin, one month free trial. We thank them for sponsoring this show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage the Kevin Pollock Trio. To I got to bust him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that someone else can bust him later. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Kevin Pollock's chat show. Thank you all, uh, or, or at least those of you who return to your seats. Um, yes, so what a night it's already been. Let's uh, see how much we've raised. <laughs> um... An amazing thrill uh, to have our next performer on. As I mentioned before, he uh, came by the chat show and did a lovely sit down with us in our, our space. And uh, bless you. And um, Allergies, man, killing me. Got a little on you, not for nothing. Um, and uh, it's uh, incredibly great to have him back. We have a night of uh, congratulations. It was announced on Friday that uh, Netflix just announced there will be a season two of the show he created called F is for family, and then he stars in. Please welcome Bill Burr. All right. Uh, so congrats on that, and uh, I, I foolishly said it also backstage. You said, "Yeah, yeah, I've known since January." Was yeah, yeah. But for some reason you can't say anything. Like they told us that, yeah, that we're picking you up and they go, don't announce it yet. So I thought there would be like a week and it was like three months. <laughs> so people just kept asking me. I just kept going, well, we don't know yet, but uh, things are looking good. Like, I don't understand. It's like, I don't understand why it's so secretive. It's great news. It's, it's not phenomenal like, news. It's not like something horrific happened. It's just like, we need to get, a, get out in front of this and try to figure out... What's going on? It's like, it's good news. People want to see it, so whatever. I mean, it's not like they're not dominating the world, so maybe they know something I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I've heard you in the stand-up bag talk about how astonishing it is that in a world of show business that numbers, 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 and everyone wants to know what the numbers are from Netflix, and their response is... Oh, yeah, the way, oh, yeah we, don't, we don't have to give numbers. <laughs> Which I think is great. It's beautiful. No, I think it's great just watching the other networks getting pissed because they got to be like, well, this underperformed and this did that and they got the numbers and shit. And Netflix just gets to be like, yeah, it's a fucking hit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just that they get to do that and the other people don't and then they get mad is just fucking hilarious to me. So I hope they never give it up. I just, it's funny watching, you know, 
networks getting upset with other networks. It's just funny to me. I don't know why. Yeah. I think it's beautiful, honestly yeah. and truly. And, and yeah, and how quickly uh, the brilliant move of just planting the flag initially with House of Cards when Showtime and HBO were, were scrambling and making crazy offers and Netflix just stepped up and said, we'll give you two seasons and here's the money, let's get going. And planting that flag and then following it the way they have has just been kind of extraordinary. Then you, you add into, yeah, we, we, we got numbers, but we're not telling you. What they are? Yeah, I think go fuck yourself. It's yeah. fantastic. I like that. They're yeah. like they're like off the grid. How and how did you how did you d decide to go with them ultimately for F is for Family? They're the only ones that bought it. <laughs> <laughs> they were like the last ones. We just kept going around pitching it to people. Called F is for families? F is, it wasn't even called F is for family. It was just I was showing up and people knew me as a stand-up, so they thought I was going to do like my Mark Maron, my Louis C.K. show or whatever, and I just looked like I'm not going to do it better than those guys. And plus, I don't want to be on a one-camera shoot and just be filming this never-ending movie and you slowly just go crazy. Just like, it just doesn't... I didn't get in this business to work, you know? So I was just like... I came in here to avoid working, right? So... Um, so we just had this idea, which, and the idea just came about from, uh, you know, I was telling family stories throughout my, my stand-up career. When I was a young comic in my 20s, everybody laughed, and then when I became the middle-aged, older comic, the laughs started to, you know, taper off when I would tell the stories, and I was starting to get like, the, oh, ooh, started getting that, and I just realized it was like this whole new generation that came up where everything was labeled, you know what I mean? They had to wear helmets when they rode bicycles, they had play dates, this is bullying, that's emotional trauma, and like, <laughs> it's just all of that shit, and it just became like, I remember standing on stage going, this is fucking funny, this is funny, <laughs> this, this, this happened to me, and I think it's, you know, I deserved it, like whatever, you know, I just, and I got frustrated, so I just stopped doing it. I was thinking, like, how can I get these things out? And I was walking my dog one day, and I was like, oh, I, why don't, what if I just animated the stories. I love that you pitched the idea to your dog first. Huh? Yeah. No, and I was just going to do five minute vignettes on my website. And I was right. going to finance the whole thing. And of course, I never did it. <laughs> never did it. And then long story, one time I had a, I had a pitch meeting with uh, Vince Vaughn's company, Wild West, and I just sort of half-assed threw it out there and they liked the idea. And then we got in business with the great Mike Price from uh, The Simpsons. And then we started trying to sell it. And that's when we were just, it was hilarious. We just, we went to uh, Adult Swim and I thought it was gonna be a layup. And we showed and like Vince came along. Like who does that? Like this guy's so into his company, he fucking comes along. So it's Vince, Peter Billingsley, Mike Lagnese, me. We came in like 15 deep and we show up. Walking in slow motion. Yeah, and we, we show up and it's like. Ralphie there's has just, his BB gun. Yeah, yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> there was like these, uh, this 20-year-old kid, 25-year-old kid, and there was this little table. He had us all sitting around the thing, like 15 of us. I just remember Vince's knees being like way up like this. And we were... The 25-year-old we was a We guy. were pitching a cartoon that takes place in 1973, and I think they were just looking at us like, who are these old guys? Like, what is this about? And we just, it just kept... It just wasn't going, and then I was finally just like, well, fuck it, I guess, you know... You know, that's it. And then Vince was the one who said, no, let's go over to Netflix. And we went over there. And I think even they were looking at me like, why, are you, why do you want to do a cartoon? But then they just kept looking at it like, oh, that's Vince Vaughn. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he seems to be behind this thing. So I think he was the guy who really sold it, like I think, like him just coming into those pitch meetings because I think it was a little bit of a weird thing to do that. Well, it's certainly a weird thing. You know, I, I imagine a lot of people uh, who are, uh, at the top of their game in stand-up comedy, everyone's trying to figure out how to package them, and they never take, rarely take the time, maybe until Louis recently, where they, where they were open to, what's the best way to capture whatever it is you want to do, honestly? Right. So the fact that you had, again, pitching to your dog first, but the realization of, oh, fuck, I can talk about this shit through animation and then make it a period piece... And also, ultimately, do the voice of your father. But it was also that I didn't want to be on a set. <laughs> Absolutely. That was one of the main things. I just didn't want to fucking sit there, dress like a cop for like nine hours, waiting to get called down there. It's, it's her Acting is what? great. What? When you get to do it, it's great. But that shit, you're just sitting there dress in like costume. I want to know who the actor was that fucked it up for the rest of us. <laughs> that... 
you know, went back in the day, you know, Chaplin movies, you probably could show up 20 minutes before you were on. Somebody fucked that up so bad that now they got to bring you there like eight hours early, get you in costume, go through the whole bullshit, and then you just sit there. I actually understand my dog now more. Because I used to always look at my dog going like, how the fuck does this thing sleep all day? How does it sleep all day? And it's just like, that. it wasn't until I sat in those trailers waiting to do something, your brain just goes like, oh, we're not, we don't have to think? All right, shut it down, shut it down. And you just you start nodding off. And you're thinking like, I got eight hours last night. This is ridiculous. You're just like in a deep fucking sleep. So now whenever I look at my dog, it's like, I totally get it. It's like, it's just sitting there waiting to go outside or eat. Other than that, it's got nothing to do, so it just shuts it down. What if you found out that your dog was an award-winning actor in a previous life? Wouldn't that fuck it up just a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so, so, all right, so in then getting a yes, you know, a lot of times comedians or, or, or any performing artist has a tough time with a yes, because then it immediately becomes, I got to work now. So you got to break these stories. Exactly what it was. And, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> And, and I thought know. I was just going to show up, you know, oh, it's animation, you know, show up my sweatpants, a baseball hat on, you know? Yeah. Say fucking yabba dabba do and I'm out, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not even yabba dabba do, but yeah. yabba dabba do. But right. it wasn't that, no, it isn't that. It's like, you know, it takes like 18 weeks for us to write these things. But I actually really enjoyed sitting there. It took me a minute to get into like the being in a writer's room and now I love it, you know? Yeah. But at first I was being, you know. What is it that you, that you love in specifics? If you could pick, uh, I just like writing dialogue and I like trying to make it real. I like making it the way it happened. And, right. I, and I really avoid going for a joke. Right. Like, oh, but this is a joke. It's more like, well, a kid doesn't talk like that. And, you know, this did happen to me. And I just m- remember, like, like, to me, so much of the really funny stuff in life is, is if it was happening to you, if it was right. happening to you, it wouldn't be funny. But if you were watching it... Happened to somebody else. And you didn't give a shit about him, it's like hilarious. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. within reason. You know what I mean? But like... Yeah, falling downstairs sucks. But seeing someone... Yeah. yeah. No, that's one if it's somebody you know, it's even funnier. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember just learning that when I was coming out of the comic strip. I think I talked to you about this one time. Like, I was... Coming up, uh, what's, what's the comic strip? That's 82nd and 2nd, right? I was coming up 2nd Avenue. I had a great set, and I'd just gone to New York. I was finally getting in the mix. I was getting the spots, and it's just like, uh, there's an excitement to that that's to this day still kills yeah. me that I can go to New York and do a spot on a weekend. And uh, so I was coming up the street, flying high, and all of a sudden, I walked by this, this bar, and the door bursted open, and two guys came out squaring off to fight, and neither one of them wanted to fight, right? (laughs) And all their friends, so they're just waiting for the other one to flinch, so they were trying to look tough, but they were terrified, and that just, that dual thing, and the heightened thing of like, oh my God, am I gonna lose all my teeth, was all in their face, and I was fucking crying, (laughs) laughing. Because I didn't give a shit what happened. I didn't want to see anybody get hurt, but it's not my friend. All right? So just watching the terror of that and then relating to it, being like, that's how I would feel. Like, I, I wouldn't want to, like, never ends well. So, um, so people, if they've seen the show, that's why we have, like, like, those moments, like, you know, where, you know, Kevin goes and he helps his little brother. And then his little brother says, thank you. And then he just punches him in the stomach and he collapses and cries. And yeah. he just walks away. And it was just like, yeah, like, that shit used to happen to me. I remember one time me and, me and a friend of mine were climbing up a tree, just innocently having a good time climbing a tree, and these big kids came along, they saw us up there, and they just started throwing rocks at us <laughs> for no fucking reason. We were just up there, <laughs> crying, hanging up there, they kept hitting our ankles and shit, and they just did it until they were tired, and then they left. <laughs> And I remember we, we sort of shook it off and then just continued climbing the tree. Do you know how many of those stories I have? One time my mother bought me this fucking outfit, right? She bought me this. Bought how long did it take you to shake it off before you climb more up the tree? The funny thing is I don't really remember anything after that other than just climbing the tree. It was just like, it just was like, that's just what happened. <laughs> and uh, so one time my mother for my, my birthday or something she bought you know westerns were still big you know back then so she bought me like a little cowboy outfit I sure had like a did. hat yeah you did I had a hat yeah, and I did. had like holsters a holster and then shooters. like the six shooters and I had like the mother of pearl but it was really like plastic yeah so and they had a little little bandana so she got me all dressed up and just sent me outside right <laughs> no no security no nothing right 
So I fucking, I don't even think I made it to the end of my driveway. Those, those same fucking kids were walking by. And I was just standing there dressed like a little cowboy. And the kid just walked up, <laughs> took the gun out, and just fucking smashed it on the tar. And they all laughed and walked away. And then I just, I just picked up the pieces of the gun and I walked into the house. This is like five minutes after she sent me out. And she goes, she's like, Jesus Christ, what happened? And I go, big kids did this. <laughs> And she just sat me down and she made me a sandwich. And that was it. There was no like follow up, we gotta find these kids. There wasn't, there wasn't like this beginning, middle and end nope. and a resolution nope. and then he learned something about himself. It was like, no, that was fucking traumatic. Dude, I remember the guys who used to collect the garbage. They were these fucking lunatics. And if you were anywhere near them, they would pretend that they were going to throw you in the truck and they would pick you up. We're going to do it! We're going to do it! And you'd be screaming. Just screaming in terror. They'd have the fucking thing on and then they'd laugh. You know? And they, they fucking did it like every week. But the, the garbage truck was so fascinating. There was no video games. It was just cool to look at. So you'd always... You know, what brought you back to the fucking truck every there day? There was always a... Yeah, there'd be a herd of little kids and you learned to be in the middle. You didn't want to be... It was like Discovery Channel. You don't want to be the, the fucking weak one. That zebra that gets eaten by the fucking crocodile. <laughs> so it was stuff like that. So forever... During my career, that's what I've been pitching. I've yeah. been pitching. I could never get it on air. I could never give it, get it on the air for whatever reasons. I mean, maybe I, I wasn't good enough or whatever, but I just couldn't get shit. Like, it was always like, you know, oh, that's misogynistic. Oh, what is that? You know, you're promoting this with children. You're doing that and everything. And it just... Make just, it a cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can throw a kid in a garbage truck in a cartoon. Absolutely. Exactly. Then now, so now I feel like I'm insulated because on two levels, because now it happens, takes place in the early 70s and it's animated. So I can just, if anybody gets offended, I'll be like, well, this is how animated people talked in the early 70s. All right. I I watched this show and and was uh, uh, just laughing into tears and, and couldn't get to the next episode fast enough. Just loved, loved, loved it. But now it's been a little while, and I've forgotten the character's name, but I need to know what the inspiration was for that little kid walking around in that fucking loaded diaper. Oh, yeah, What yeah. is happening there? There was always those... Describe the character for the people. All right, so there's, there's two... I think they're Ben and Ken. I don't even fucking know their names. Um, they're just... You know, they always had, like, those kids in your neighborhood where... The dirty neighbor like, kids. Yeah, their parents were, like, never home. The lights weren't on. You didn't know what they did... You didn't know, you just... If you ever went to the house, it smelled so weird. You never got in it. Like, I never, like, it was just these fucking kids. And, like, your parents would tell you not to hang out with them. They were, like, the first ones that tried drugs. They, you know, had slingshots and all that type of shit. So we got two of those, and one of them's, you know, a little bit older, and the other one's younger, and he's, uh, yeah, he just sort of walks around with, like, a T-shirt and a diaper. A loaded diaper, clearly. Um, I mean, it's yeah. hanging. Well, that, that was actually a little... Uh, inspiration of my youngest brother where there were days like in the summer there was like five of us and my mother was working nights so she would just like send us outside and there were days that he would just play outside and he had a t-shirt on and just had his diaper on <laughs> and we would race Tonka trucks sure. down the driveway to like the busiest street in the neighborhood you just you just ride on the back of them and uh <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. See, but you see how like quiet that got the second I went to a real kid? <laughs> all of a sudden it's just like, well, that's terrible parenting. And I hope, I hope he was all right. They need to call some fucking group. <laughs> They're always calling some fucking group, yeah. clearly. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now are you, are you upset again that you have to write a season two? That no, go no, no, I'm loving it. I'm actually, last year I was in the writer's room and I just was punching up all the stuff that uh, you know, Emily Towers, Dave Richardson, Tom Giannis, we had, we had a killer staff and um, you know, those guys all wrote the first season. So I was just, you know. Would you give them these stories from I, your life? Yeah, but everybody has stories. Everybody yeah. like, everybody, yeah. It was kind of like how we put together the writer's room where people just kind of came in and we were just like, you know, yeah, did your brother ever just beat you up for no reason? Just, you just sort of feed them and if they had a bunch of those stories, right. we'd be like, all right, let's, you know, let's, 
sit down more with this person. But if they were like, no, my parents are great. My, my brother get along great. Get the it's like, fuck out. Yeah, it's all right. it was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not in a bad way. It's just like you're not going to be able. Not this show. Right. You know, so when it comes to casting, um, uh, your choice, whose choice for you to play the part of, voice the part of your father? It just made the oh, most that sense. Was, no, that was always going to be me. Okay. So then you cast Sam Rockwell as the neighbor. You got to describe this character. This is fucking loaded and fantastic. And okay, it's uh, uh, Vic Reynolds is his name. So basically, Frank's his whole deal is the guy that I play. Uh, he's a guy that you know. He met the woman he was he want he was supposed to be with, but like he knocked her up. So everything kind of got fast forward, and he had a kid, and he wanted to be a pilot. He wanted to do all this stuff, and because he had his kid, it just derailed everything. So now he works down at the airport you know, in like baggage handling. Yeah. So he gets to see his dream literally taking off every day. Every as day. He, <laughs> as he deals, he's like so close. It would have been better if he just worked in a hardware store or something. But so, um, you know, he got married young and all that type of shit. And like, he's still just trying to gain his footing. He's still figuring out who he is and all that stuff. And the guy across the street, Vic Reynolds is just one of these guys who just like, you know. Uh, he's got it all. He's got it all. He's got the vet, the Corvette. He's got the Corvette. He's got a motorcycle. He's got all these hot chicks. He's a good looking guy he's blonde he's always yeah. got a shirt off for no reason yeah he's got a shirt off for no reason <clears throat> but the thing about him is he's a good person so frank resents him but vic's got nothing but love for him so frank's sort of fighting like this one-sided war with him <laughs> and he always tries to get under his skin but vic either is too zen like or even maybe not even too smart to even get that frank is all over him so that's another thing. It's sort of like at work, he sees his, his dream taken off, and then when he looks out his bay window, he sees this guy across the street and sees what his life possibly could have been. Yeah. Um, if and Sam Rockwell, yeah. what a choice to play that part. Jesus oh, yeah. Christ. Yeah, he's hilarious. How did that happen? Uh, Vince. Vince yeah. knew him. Vince, Peter, Billingsley, they all knew him, and uh, they were like, yeah, yeah, we're going to get him to... Uh, he'll do it. We'll talk him into doing it. You know, he's always doing Broadway or some big movie or something, so somehow they got him, and, uh, and I think that that's when we, we started getting some names you know because he signed on so right and some of the other people involved uh, Laura Dern plays uh, Susan my wife yeah. Justin Long plays the radical kid who just yeah. who, who's that is that character one of your brothers or who do, it's who, um, amalgamation no yeah I did like an amalgamation I wanted my family to be able to sit down and watch this thing and not feel like oh my god like mortified like yeah. so it's all <laughs> like they'll recognize Moments. Like catchphrases like that, I'll put you through the fucking wall. That my dad used to say that. <laughs> like he would say that. I'll put you through that fucking wall. And, and one way, time, one time he did say that outside, and we sort of snickered. Like so, we were standing out in the fucking yard. Like there's, it's like yeah, dad, there's no wall. There's no wall. <laughs> I don't know what you. Um, so the beauty of a, of a phrase like that from a father is the vehemency with, with which it's delivered. He's so. Fucking dialed in and serious when he says it. Yeah. No self-awareness. How ridiculous it might sound to everyone else. Right? Oh yeah, and we were terrified of him. And it wasn't until later that I, I really looked back at my childhood. I was like, that guy never even came close to being physical or anything like that. My mother, on the other hand, would just hit you with any blunt object. <laughs> She'd get her. She was a way more slow burn. But then once she fucking snapped. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. The Salad about the spoons, woman. hair brushes. My dad had a paddle from his fraternity. She used to fucking, we used to hide that thing. She used to line us up. And you'd just be sitting there waiting, you know? Oh, she'd get tired. She'd miss your ass, hit the back of your legs. It's just, it's just the fucking worst. But I have to admit, like when I look back, I can't really ever remember a time I didn't deserve it. Like it was always like I, I totally deserve it. Except one time my brother said that I kicked my other brother in the face. I didn't. I kicked him in the stomach. Which was way less than that was when my mother was brushing her you hair. Still fucking kicked and she him. came. She went to slam and I just got my head out of the way. It hit me right in the middle of the back. And the brush just exceeded oh, oh right. the fucking brush explodes. Yeah. And uh and I just remembered, like, she was, like, like, for the rest, like, I think until I moved out, she's still she's so frugal. She just, like, he held the brush thing in her hand, like, <laughs> like, using it like that. You know when black guys try to get waves, you know, that brush that they use? That's what she looked like. She was just, <laughs> I was like, Mom, just throw it out. She goes, there's, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. 
Oh. Yeah, that was her thing. There's nothing wrong with it. That was her catchphrase? There's yeah, nothing, nothing wrong with it? Yeah, nothing wrong with it. Yeah, <clears throat> eat this before I throw it out. She was one of those people. <laughs> Mom, it's been in there three weeks. There's nothing wrong with it. That's you. That's you over here raising a house of, of what, mold and asbestos? Is that That's right. Yeah. I grew up in a house of mold and asbestos. What do you yeah. Think? Nothing goes to waste. Right. Uh... Yeah. No, but you see that there, that, that this fucking thing. Like I used to tell those jokes about getting hit and all that stuff. I mean, it, it, I, I had to close with it in the early '90s. I had to close yeah. with it. Now, whenever I tell those stories, the hush I'm falls. I'm literally over. sitting here, fine. Yeah. <laughs> I prefaced it with I deserved it, and it was still like, oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Kick my brother in the stomach. I mean. Don't you guys like those instant justice YouTube videos? <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen those things? No. Karma, whatever the fuck they call them. Uh, tell me, uh, we talked a little bit backstage about, I, I started in stand-up and when a few good, me, a few good men came out, however people uh, discover you is how they know you. And that film turned into this, big success and shit on 15 years of stand-up, two HBO specials, that's how people were going to know me, and then I started working a lot as a character actor, and then I would go do stand-up to this day, and people are like, oh, the guy from the movie, oh, he does stand-up. Oh, so they thought you did movies, and then you're trying to cash in doing (laughs) stand-up. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, and there's nothing worse, right? It's like someone steals your joke. the comedy club, is he going to be wearing the Navy outfit when he does... (laughs) (laughs) I'm not going unless he's wearing that. Nobody likes the whites. Yeah, so... Those nurse shoes. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. So, consequently, uh, I would be famous enough for people to want me to be in their movies, but to go out and play big theaters... I mean, I've done theaters, but mostly it's clubs, which I, I of course, love doing. Anywhere they'll have me. So the idea of rising through working it out as a stand-up and, and not only getting better at what you do, but having an audience build and build and build, and there's breaking moments along the way that you could point to. Here's that set where I did, and I said the thing and defended, uh, who was it at the great show that the fucking audience yelled and screamed at or heckled or somebody, and you went on stage in, in, uh, oh, Philly. in Philly. Yeah, yeah there's these moments in time where you could maybe trace, but along the way you're, you're putting in the work and you're, you're obviously evolving as a performer and now as I said at the outset arguably whatever you you're playing the world so I need to know a couple things about that honestly from a place of genuine curiosity and, and amazement what what that you know like you talk about going to New York and being able to get a set on a on a weekend that feeling will never go away because those are one of the most hard-earned it seemed impossible exactly I remember going to the comic strip and seeing, uh, you know, Greg Fitzsimmons was helping me out. And um, he said, yeah, just tag along and blah, 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 blah. So I was tagging along with him on the weekend. And I just remember, no, on a weekday, I should say. It was like a Tuesday or right. something. Right. And I remember him going, yeah, come down to the, uh, the comic strip. I got a 940 spot. And I remember, you know, that little area up to the side? I went up and I sat and I watched him. It was like, you know, probably like 30 people during the week. And I just remember looking at him on stage going like, he has a 940 spot at the comic strip on Tuesday. And I just thought that that was the coolest thing yeah. ever. Like Lucian, rest his soul, he knew who he was. He called in, left of veils, and he got spots. I mean, yeah. it, just, it just seemed like... Unattainable. Yes. Whereas I mean, I no knew one... I was going to get there, but it just seemed like what major boulder is going to move out of the way that I can somehow be that guy with a 940 spot on like a Tuesday. Yeah, it does seem absolutely unattainable early on, whereas you're not fantasizing what's it going to be like to play the Sydney Opera House. But now you are performing where I, I don't... It, English isn't the first language by a stretch. What are some of the places around the world now that you've been to in the last year? Uh, I've been everywhere from like Helsinki, Finland, to uh, Mumbai, India. It well, was... Uh, yeah. And so an idiot thinks, oh, so all the tourists that are in town in Mumbai. You're you like know what's a- funny? It's the joke I forgot to do when I wanted, because all those, they're all fucking telemarketers, half of them over there talking <laughs> to us. And it's the joke I forgot to do, because it was the last stop on the tour I wanted to say. I was going to open with that. Like, you know, I probably talked to half of you fuckers already. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I know your name isn't Cliff. 
You know, but you, I got I got to tell you, Matt, that I had so much fun in India. How? Describe, please. Because they're, they're fucking hilarious people. They're ball breakers, and they're just like I called this podcast. And stand up is new over there. Like they're in like their Lenny Bruce years. Like people get in trouble and shit. So I called in this podcast. I was like in Australia, and I called this podcast to hype the show. And the, the guys were all comedians, and they they were going like, "Yeah, when you come here, you should talk about this. You should talk about politics." And my mom, maybe, and they just kept going down that road. Then I'm like, "Wait a minute, do you guys talk about this shit?" And they start laughing, and I go, "You guys are gonna get me fucking arrested." And they died laughing, like they were just setting me up. Like it's not like you would literally get arrested, but it's like. You could get in trouble, or like it's a you'd, you'd have to basically like Singapore. I was worried about because I was like, you know, that kid got caned all those years ago, and and I was sitting there, <laughs> sitting there, weren't worrying about that. And they don't want you to talk about a religion. They don't want you to talk about all this shit. But like, if you just come there, right, and you just do your spot and then leave, that's not going to happen. But if you if you set up shop there and every week. They'd have to be getting complaint after complaint after complaint after complaint. And then finally, it's like a jerk-off job. Some guy finally comes down there. It's like, hey, can you knock it off? Can you just stop it so we don't have to beat the shit out of you? And you're like, all right, all right. So it's, it's, not, it's not as bad. But um, So you'll go to uh, Singapore or where have you. Yeah. And you'll do the exact same Why wouldn't you? Act. Just to see it. Just to see Well, sure, that part it. I get. Right. It's the doing your act on stage. No, you do your, I, I learned you do it the exact same way because I remember even just going to England, I, I started, I got in my head and I was going to do something on squirrels and I was thinking like, wait, do they have squirrels here? Did I see any squirrels? Or any of that shit? For the record, they have smaller ones, little red ones. They don't have the big, for the record, the big gray ones that we have. And it made me on my heels and I, I didn't have, because I was questioning what I was doing. So it, it took like, when I was in Norway, I went to Oslo, Norway, and that was the time I was just, the crowd was drunk a little bit, which I always liked, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to just do my shit, and I just did it, and then I learned that that was the formula. You just go out and pretend you're here, and you just plow forward until something doesn't work, and then you make fun of yourself for thinking that, oh, I thought you guys had squirrels, you know, and then, <laughs> and then, then you just go right back to it. I use all the slang. That's crazy. I'll talk about Tom Brady. Like, I don't give a shit. It's just like, <laughs> I just fucking. Um, so yeah. every country you go to, that's, that's the act. That's the deal. Yeah. That's you just deal. keep it pretty much the same. I mean, that's, you know, if something strikes me, if I go to those places, like, you know, I'll, uh, I'll talk about it. But yeah, essentially. And uh, that, that crossing that line of, all right, you're going to do giant theaters. I mean, you're not doing arenas, thankfully. Please don't. It's just not the art form for it, you know? Don't no. you think? Yeah, yeah, it's not my... Uh, I've, I've done one. Right. And what was, what was the takeaway from that? It was unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever do Gator was, Ground no, for 90,000 people? I, I mean, never did that, yeah, thank see, God. But no, I did, uh, I did Madison Square Garden for the New York Comedy Festival. And uh, what was cool is I played drums as a hobby. So during the day, I mean, you rent it out for the day. So I, brought, I rented a drum kit and some amps and shit. Me and my friends, I got to show you the video of that. We just, in an empty Madison Square Garden, as they were setting up chairs for playing like Iron Man, Welcome to the Jungle. And we had the best fucking time. What was great, though, was it oh took, it took the, the, the edge off of being there. Because sure. we already were on the stage. We were playing. Turned it into like a clubhouse vibe. And uh, fortunately, uh, the two guys that opened, Verzi and uh, Joe DeRosa. Joe DeRosa wore this fucking Golden Girls sweater on stage and I was like willing people to heckle him and nobody said anything and it just so annoyed me that I went on stage and did 17 minutes about the sweater shitting on his sweater <laughs> and I just forgot where I was at it was just one of those things after that it just fucking took off and uh yeah it was um yeah, but like that's said, Madison it was, Square it was unbelievable I mean, yeah. yeah and other yeah. than that yeah I don't want to go play with like the fucking the, I don't know, what yeah. the Winnipeg Jets play. I don't want to fucking be standing in there. Um, yeah, I would rather do, you know. Because Steve this, Martin this. talked about when he, he was the first stand-up really to do arenas. And he said, it got to the point pretty quickly on where I realized I'll put the worst material up front because they're not even listening to what I'm saying. They're just going ape shit for anything stupid that I'm doing. Right. I mean, that was an act that was more of a cartoon at, at times, of course, with physical comedy. Plus, he had, a di he had a different kind of thing. That guy had, like, a massive, like, pop culture moment. Yes. I don't have that. I have a 24-year 
slow, like. <laughs> but they laugh, yeah. you know, it's not self-deprecating, it's true, and, it, and it's actually the perfect climb, quite frankly, because you're earning it every step of the way, and this can only lead one place, okay. and it Please ain't good. Please don't make good. that gesture. Well, dude, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this doesn't work for you, Sam Levine? No, no put that down, put it down. <laughs> <laughs> what if I just did the rest of the interview like this? Yeah, just do that. Yeah, um, yeah this Well, slow. my shit leads, it all leads to that. It all leads to that. That's why I want to start buying like rental properties because I'd like to gracefully get out of this fucking business. <laughs> rather, you know, rather than being that old guy in a tux at uh-huh. some fucking casino. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're happy and you know it. <laughs> Doing that fucking gig. I'm not saying I'll ever quit doing stand-up, but I would like to have the option like, to not do it. There's a part of you that would rather be... Like when I'm like 70, I don't want to be fucking... Yeah. He's coming to Cincinnati! <laughs> <laughs> Three shows Saturday, two on Friday. Fuck that. I just be out there. <laughs> My feet in some fucking bowl of hot water backstage. <laughs> Back at the hotel, you're in hot water in, up yeah, to the no. ankles. No, I don't want to. Do sure, that. you don't want that. No, no, no. I'll let you know what it's like soon, though. So, <laughs> Bill Burr, Jeff Goldblum, Colin Hay, Sam Levine, Jamie Foxx. Thank you all very, very, very much. I got a paper out in four hours. <laughs>